and welcome to the Quentin Turner Podcast. I am going to just apologize in advance. I'm a little bit under the weather, so I'm going to try and mute, but it may not always happen. So hopefully I will keep the snibbles down to a minimum, but uh, you've been forewarned. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I wanted to let you know that I am doing a fundraiser for Combating the Who. So if you want to see me go to Geneva and be a part of the Geneva Project, you can support the trip there. It's a very expensive trip. And uh, that is the Gives and Goes at my website, CourtneyTurner.com. And I spell my name like Courtenay, C-O-U-R-T-E-N-A-Y, T-U-R-N-E-R.com. And we have all sorts of great ways that you can support the podcast as well. You can buy me a coffee. We have, if you prefer analog snail mail, you can send letters and uh, uh, financial support that way as well. And that address would be Courtney Turner. 6041 Rural Plains Circle, Suite 110, number 106, Franklin, Tennessee, 37064. And we also have a Venmo. It's Courtney Dash or hyphen Turner uh, at Courtney Dash uh, Turner Venmo. And we also have some great products. Be Until the end of April, you can get $150 off your relax sauna if you use the promo code quartz that's c-o-u-r-t-z and that is a great discount so definitely take advantage of that if that is something you are considering you will still get a discount afterwards but definitely great to take advantage of the 150 dollars off and you can go through and look at if there are other products that you would like uh we have the defy the grid which is the gold backs which are beautiful souvenirs even if you didn't want the actual you know impregnated gold uh, and you can use them as legal tender and uh, honey colony all of it is promo code court c-o-u-r-t-z and definitely check out the crowd rank we've been very busy diligently adding the stack there so you can uh check out and you can build your own so we can aggregate news together and uh, build our own uh, news aggregate. So go over there and show me some love. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring Matt Errett on. I am super excited for this discussion. This is something I have been really wanting to dive into. Uh, we are going to talk about some weaponized philosophy, or at least what it looks like to me. It looks like it has been weaponized and uh, we're going to discuss that so matt how are you doing today hey courtney i'm i'm doing okay i'm looking forward to this chat <laughs> likewise yeah so what i have noticed and i i've discussed this with you with, and we've touched on it in previous discussions as well uh but what i've noticed is there seems to have been it looks very contrived like there is a you know polarization kind of a, a dialectic that is and it looks contrived. I don't know, but it looks like there's some evidence that points in that direction where Aristotle has been kind of uh, touted as the the heroic figure of uh, a lot of conservatives, quote unquote conservatives. I, I put these things in quotes these days because, uh, you know, not that they don't have any philosophical or ideological root, but it looks like in modern practicality, they're target audiences for marketing. And uh, that mm -hmm. seems to be how things go today. So a lot of conservatives look at Aristotle as being kind of this, uh, you know, father of conservatism and a hero uh, of uh, philosophy. And they look at Plato as being the father of communism. And they see him as kind of being the root of all evil is uh, sort of how it's been touted. And uh, I think that, you know, nuance is certainly lost in that explanation or that uh you know yeah in putting it that way um and i also don't know that i'm a hundred percent in agreement with it it seems a little yeah i don't know so i i wanted to get to the roots of some of that yeah, <laughs> yeah no no i i think that that's a great way to like create the maximum space for a conversation to flow into mm -hmm. um as far as setting the stage is concerned, because mm -hmm. you're right. Like there is this huge um, revival, you could say almost, of, yeah. of Aristotelian um, philosophy. Yeah. Which has never really gone away, but it sort of took a bit of a backseat with the uh, the Enlightenment period a little bit, the early stage Enlightenment, where 
the method of Aristotle was seen as somewhat outdated, something that fed into the scholastics of the medieval age that relied a lot, a lot upon like axioms, a lot of like blind assumptions of general truths that you could never, your mind couldn't reasonably investigate, but you had to axiomatically believe them to be so. Mm -hmm. And then construct a philosophy of details around said giant sort of rules, unquestionable rules, right? Leaps yes. of blind logical faith. So that, that fed into the scholastic period of the medieval ages. And um, that obviously has some serious limits because if there's a domain that the mind is not allowed to examine and understand why is it true or false, mm -hmm. you can't examine your own axioms, then you're really constricted in terms of how you, where you can go with your mind and your ability to discover anything. So yeah, the, the, in the enlightenment period, there was this idea that no, you know, Aristotle, well, it's a little outdated. So we're going to now, embrace empiricism, this radical like embrace of just sensualism, uh, the senses, right. things that we can measure, smell, taste, touch, feel. And then with the gradients of sight, light, heat, sound amplitudes, you know, you could like create metrics, scalar metrics that could be charted. And you could call that scientific because then you could put it on like a Cartesian graph and associate right. numbers with activities of like rays of light or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then that became the Baconian, the Francis Bacon sort of right. method, which was a, appeared to be on the surface a rejection of Aristotle, but actually it was Aristotelianism coming in through a different a different pathway. And a lot of these these creatures were also like Descartes himself, and a lot of the the, the promoters of this um, this school that emerged generally out of the British Royal Society. These are the founders of the, of the British Royal Society, the followers of Francis Bacon, who carried on his, his method, uh, including, you know, people like Robert Flood, the leading Rosicrucian. Um, these were the, the founders of the Royal, the Royal, not only the Royal Society, but the Invisible College of Rosicrucianism that was sort of a blend of various hermetic, Zoroastrian, Kabbalist, Babylonian, Chaldean, some Neoplatonism, like sort of all packaged together. And then that became like a school of occultism that was promoting, on the other hand, radical empiricism for the masses and, a, and an occultism for the for the few, the, the elect, yeah. the elite, the initiated. And uh, and then in, you know, that then created this this other weird thing that I'm sure we're going to talk more about later on. But then now in more modern times. We have all of that occultism masquerading as a control factor in science. But then yep. now we also have this Aristotelian revival that's trying to say like Aristotle at least had a, he believed in truth. He mm -hmm. could see things cr crystal clear, no ambiguity. If you wanted a definition, Aristotle gave it to you. Non-liberal, right? So a lot of conservative minded people are they're like, oh, we're in such a fluid world where nobody believes in truth. Aristotle right. believed in truth. I can hold that truth and just memorize you know, you want to know what justice is. Well, he'll tell you what it is for the slave and for the master, right? right? He'll give you all the definitions of justice in a fi finished, crystallized way. And I like that. It gives me stability in a world of, of instability. I, I want, so it's concerning because yeah, Aristotle and the thing that Aristotle was rejected by as far as this hermetic Rosicrucian Neoplatonist revival um, are both sort of two anti-Platonic movements that yes. I think are obstructing the real issue that you and I are, are going to be chatting more about, which is like, well, what the hell is Plato? And is it the same thing or different from the, the Neoplatonic yeah. or Aristotelian schools? Like we're, yeah. So yeah, exactly. sure. I'm concerned by it. <laughs> I, I'm very concerned by it. And, and I'm very concerned by how deceptive it is today. Um, because now you have the rise of, and you know, we'll get to the Platonic discussion, which will make this more clear, um, the Neoplatonists, I think, in particular. But you have the rise of, they're certainly not new, but I mean, with the UN, it's all these like, you know, theosophical cults, essentially. And, you know, they're very much coming out of uh, a lot of, you know, like these Neoplatonic, I, I would argue, actually going back to ancient mystery school uh, type religion. So it's a, this isn't, and of course, the whole transhuman, I think, uh, you know, mission, and of course, the AI world society, the singularity is near. Uh, so it's all very relevant today. This isn't just like, let's talk about things from thousands of years ago that have no relevance. I, I just want to make that, you know, clear and apparent to the audience that, you know, this is where we're seeing this through line and the trajectory. So it's important to tangle out how it's been interpreted and how it's being used. Um, and I also wanted to address with uh, Aristotle, I think it's almost a little bit 
ironic in a sense, or maybe it's uh, intentional, <laughs> but I, I find Aristotle to be very materialist. You know, the way you explained it, like he presents a very, uh, you know, clear, cogent kind of uh, uh, codified explanation for things. And then you don't have the, the, the reader or the, uh, you know, doesn't have to then do the work to do any uh, personal intrinsic or even extrinsic analysis uh, to arrive at truth. It's just kind of taken at face value. Mm. And that's kind of the reason I find it a little bit ironic is because it's very much being pitched to, you know, I was talking about the marketing, right? It's very much being pitched to a lot of the, the right who, uh, the quote unquote right, who oftentimes see themselves as very religious, very Christian. And yet when you actually look at Plato, he does advocate that there is some sort of a, a creator. Uh, you know, even when he talks about the forms, it's not worshiping, you know, it's not a Gaia religion. It's that the, the creation here on earth comes from somewhere and was created. At least that's, that's how I read it. And Aristotle kind of doesn't. It's a lot more about controlling here on earth. And it's a very materialistic view. Um, I know I'm oversimplifying, but that's kind of how I see it. And it's uh, it's just interesting how it's being marketed. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, I mean, Aristotle called it the unmoved mover, mm -hmm. um, which is like this absolute, he had the, such an abstracted idea of, of the creator that he had to pay, whether he believed it or not, I don't know. Oh, but he had to pay, I mean, certain... Uh, uh, lip service to the idea of, of a creator God, but in his cosmology, that creator God is so perfect that it is effectively incapable of acting upon creation itself. So it's an unmoved mover. It's the mover that is, is, is purely, it's like this radical, um, I interpretation of Plato, but done to an absurd degree, um, by, 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 cause like, what does Plato say? And here's the, before actually we say this, uh, before yeah. I say this, I just want to set the stage a, a little bit for what I'm about to say. Okay. Um, we have been told, for those who may not know, that Aristotle is the student of Plato and mm -hmm. advanced upon his teacher's philosophy. Oh, this is important. That's, that's a popular myth that's been yeah. concocted and promoted generation to generation for 2,400, 2,500 years. Yeah. Um, this is also very important because when we're talking about Plato and Aristotle, it, it, it gets us into the realm of the, the idea of ideas. What is the method around which ideas are generated? And since human beings are the creature that is defined by our capacity to make or our, our moral failure to not make discoveries as a species and as individuals, um, it is very important to, to take the time to think about, well, what is this tool, this, this, this instrument that I was born with that called mind? Right, which right. seems to interact with the infrastructure of the brain, but it isn't quite the brain per se. Right. Um, you know, people could have half their brain cut out and still develop and generate universal concepts and discoveries, even yeah. if it's like deprived, if it deprives them of some physical capacities that it shows that the, there's a higher function that the mind sort of is, be, is beyond. It's connected to the brain, but it's not the brain per se. Right. Now, what method are we going to util utilize as we improve upon, as we should, right? Our bodies are going to mature. So we, we would want our minds and our conscience to also mature and strengthen as we experience, you know, the, this physical experience called life. We want to make sure that that, that that instrument is used well. But like any instrument, you could use it with bad techniques, right? You could use a fallacious technique to play the guitar or to... Uh, to try to, you know, do engineering and deal mm -hmm. with engines that ultimately makes the engine worse. That makes the, the capacity to perform music worse by using a bad technique, um, right. with bad assumptions. If you, but then there's, there's also natural law. There's, there's techniques that allow the, the instrument to be used the way it was designed to be used right? and used well and better so that we can always make more discoveries, a greater density of discoveries next year than I did last year and do it better and, and choose to it, have those discoveries, small, big, alike. like an athlete doing something with good form versus bad form. You may get the job done, but it, over time you're not going to make progress. So Exactly. You're going to be going to physiotherapy. You're going to be breaking down and ultimately, yeah, you're going yeah, two steps forward, 10 steps backwards. And, and you don't realize you're going into a deep hole. 
Um, exactly that. And so the mind, you know, we often like are aware of like what we put into our, our, our bodies, food wise, edu- work wise, you know, physical fitness wise is right. something which is important, but, but in our society, people have tended to let not place that same quality of value in those same standards upon what are we consuming and what are we doing exercise wise for this metaphysical mind. So this yeah. whole thing of Plato and Aristotle, it's so important to take the time to think about that. And people should, as, as a word of notice for those listening, read a little bit of Plato, like read a few dialogues, whole dialogues out of like, not out of context. Cause that's often the way I was given it in school. Mm-hmm. It's like, here's this section from Plato's Republic or a section from the symposium or the section from the credo or the philate philebus, but you're never encouraged to read a whole context of a dialogue unto itself. And nobody mentions the Timaeus. <laughs> oh, the Timaeus. Yeah. That, that, that is a confounding thing for a lot of, a lot of scholars. Um, yes. Yeah. However, it's it's a bit of a breath of fresh air, and it's 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 when you're like looking at it with fresh eyes, and you start realizing that Plato's works and his method, especially the Timaeus, yeah, directly inspired the greatest minds throughout history to make discoveries. The yeah. biggest discoveries, axiomatic, paradigm shifting discoveries, were made by people like uh, Platonists, like like Nicholas of Cusa. Um, like Gottfried Leibniz, like, like Johannes Kepler, uh, so many St. Augustine earlier on, um, all the way through Max Planck and the, the leading figures who ushered in the overthrow of, of, of Newtonian cosmology at the turn of the 19th, uh, 20th century right. around Madame Curie. And, and th- these were all people who were artists, scientists utilizing a platonic method self-consciously. They had all been immersed in Plato, many of them in, in the Timaeus and used that, those concepts right. to generate the discoveries that they made into the physical universe and built upon them. So contributing a direct line of continuity over, from Plato's works all the way to the present. And when you read the Timaeus from that standpoint, with that appreciation, you can understand why people like uh, Kepler, who discovered the three uh, universal laws of planetary motion, said, and I've got a quote here uh, from, from Kepler in his Harmonies of the World, where he discovered the harmonic law utilizing the Timaeus hypothesis of Timaeus of Lockery um, of the harmonic arrangements of the planets utilizing the the platonic solids, the five platonic solids, and then the musical proportions that occur geometrically from a string. That's what was outlined by Plato. That's what Kepler animated his whole life around. And when he proved the, his third law by demonstrating the harmonic relationship of the planets around the sun, he said in that book, um, quote, where Aristotle draws, there's a quote from Pla- from Kepler, where Aristotle draws universal conclusion and convicts Plato of the stupidity, which is his own fantasy, and finally where to the platonic picture of the self-taught slave, that's the Mino dialogue, he opposes, that's Aristotle, a contrary picture of his own, asserting that the mind in itself is empty, not only of other knowledge and of mathematical categories, but also of species and is just a blank sheet so that nothing is written on it, but everything can be written upon it. From this aspect, I say he is not to be tolerated in the Christian religion. Wow. That's, and that's Johannes Kepler identifying correctly some of the Achilles heels in Aristotle, who was basically saying, oh, I love Plato, Uh but then redefining what Plato was doing in his dialogues in order to extract the core of Plato's philosophy, which is the idea that one, we have an immortal soul, which is provably so by the virtue of the fact that anybody can be taught by through asking questions, hence the dialogue format, right? right? Allowing a, a type of ambiguity so that the mind can be perplexed and make a discovery to resolve a dissonance. And mm-hmm. by virtue of said discovery into something universally true, like the doubling of the of the square or the proof of the mm-hmm. Pythag- Pythagorean theorem or whatever, any discovery that, that has a universal attribute demonstrates right. there must be some similarity between the universality outside of us that's being discovered in the internal uh, thing be, that is doing the discovering. There must be some similarity of the inside outside universe. And hence the soul must have that same immortal quality. Um, and on top of that in the Timaeus, the other predicate or uh, principle of, of Plato mm-hmm. is that the universe is created by a reasonable, rational, moral creator, a unified one creator that created the universe good in its own <laughs> image that had a and that did it in a way that allows us to participate in discovering and acting upon said universe and that is that is all embedded 
in the Timaeus and other dialogues as well, which Aristotle completely wipes out as, as Kepler truly does identify. Aristotle says, no, we are a blank slate, just like John Locke in the British yeah. empiricist school afterwards, that only has information written upon it. There's nothing already there. So you just have to force definitions like you would filling boxes into an attic. That is the mind filling things in when it gets too full, you have to erase things like any of us have felt when we tried to cram for a, a, a college exam and you just cram and then you don't remember a week later what the hell you put in your head because right. it was just information as nouns, as objects you're fitting in. Right. That is like filling a vessel, not lighting a flame. So it's right. different. The Plato method is lighting a flame, Aristotle filling a vessel, and that vessel only has a limit to it. And the other thing is that impotent, impotent, uncreative God that doesn't really have the power of, a, of an active creator in that sense. It's, it's kind of like a, a you know, <laughs> it's, it's a bit of an irrational creator. And, and in that sense, since the creator can't create actively as mm -hmm. an unmover, well, then all of this motion, this, this action in the physical world that we, we live in and investigate yeah. is basically fully removed from the creator that created the universe. Maybe he didn't even really create the universe in that sense, since it, the, the mm -hmm. non-being or the, the being which doesn't change which is that right. higher realm of Aristotle, yes. is 100% severed from the realm of flux of becoming. Mm -hmm. Where in Plato, there's a, there is an interplay. Those are There's not an absolute divide. In Aristotle, those two states of existence have an absolute divide, as it does in a weirder way for the Neoplatonists as well. Mm -hmm. so in that sense, everything is, de is defined by who has the power. And hence, yeah. Aristotle's other, other point is that unlike Plato, he says, no, people are born as masters or they're born as slaves based upon their, um, the, 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 the random, the, not the random, sorry, based upon their family nobility will yep. define whether they, they are born into a slave or a, a master family. And thus will have a different set of moral codes that will apply to them as far as like the two justices, the two virtues in Aristotle's world. It's all, it's all broken up. And he's mm -hmm. just assumed that it's so because it's 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 so in his lifetime, and so he he asserts that it must always be so. Right. The, the master and the slaves are it's an it's a universal that he just forces onto an unhealthy social construct. Whereas in Plato's world, he's demonstrating that slave children, like like Mino's slave, that that mm -hmm. old old or whatever boy, have more creative power than the slave master Mino himself, who was a real person in the world that Plato lived in, who was actually a traitor to Athens. Right. Um, and and that just demonstrates that no, um, the slaves slavery itself is an affront to natural law. Even though he didn't have the ability to just come out and explicitly say it like Lincoln did with the Emancipation Proclamation, because it's you just you got to pick and choose how you fight the battle at different times. You know, when certain contexts allow or, or will cause you to die. You know, <laughs> if you do right. it in a certain literal way. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that's such a great point because it's like how. And I think people today can really resonate with that is how do you choose to fight the battle? Because some people will choose to make compromises, you know, for the sake of getting certain messages out or for, you know, certain creative endeavors. And they, they get, you know, they get flack for that. But it's, well, is it that, you know, you have to weigh out what are the priorities? Is it more important for, you know, future generations that that endeavor be created, that, you know, message be carried? Um, but oftentimes that the, you know, the alternative could be if you don't do it a certain way, yeah, as you said, it could be death and that would be death for, you know, all of the, the creative endeavors. So, yeah, I think that is really important for people to understand is the milieu in which Plato and Aristotle were immersed. I wanted to bring up when you were talking about, um, the mind and, uh, you know, how we have this, uh, essentially we have an immortal spirit. And I think that that's, uh, you know, pretty uh, that's pretty evident. You know, I don't think it needs to be, although I, I, people would argue with me on it, but, <laughs> but, but it, it, in my estimation, it's pretty self-evident, but they, uh, I, I was reading in, I told you I read, uh, the uh, LaRouche's campaigner and, uh, the secrets known only to the inner elites. And it definitely was a mind trip for me, but in there, he talks about how it was the Germans who, uh, change the definition of uh, Anaxim Anaximenes uh, air, meaning kind of, uh, you know, air, and they, they, they translated it to mean like the spirit and the mind. And I, I thought that was about that. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that 
I have um, the quote, but that issue of the campaigner is golden. I, I'd read that many times um, when I first encountered the figure of LaRouche back in 2006. And that was, I was, you know, trying to, I've been battling, wrestling with the idea of like, what are these secret societies? What is their role in history? What are they? Do they truly have special knowledge? Do they, are they tapping into real powers from demonic forces or is it, is it, is there another explanation? Right. Um, so I've been wrapped wrestling with that for a while and so when i encountered this particular magazine from 1978 the secrets known only to the inner elites i was i was really blown away because it was the first time i had i'd been introduced to a, a a a rational um comprehensive overview of the clash of these different masonic lodges throughout the ages yeah with different factions, one representing the sort of worldview of, of Aristotle and the other faction representing the worldview of Plato. Mm -hmm. um, rise to things like the Golden Renaissance, the American Revolution, um, pretty much everything really, really good. And inversely, from the Aristotelian factions who were always striving for basically global feudal stasis as yep. their ideal state, um, every single turn towards decay and, and decline in dark age. So you've got these like two Renaissance dark age dynamics uh, battling it out, right? And different yeah. people at different times will like tap into one or the other based upon their identities, their choices in life. Going back to even before there was Plato, there was this, this yeah. sort of, you know, schism between those who aspire to making like living according, abiding by conscience, developing reason, loving, mm -hmm. loving the, the self, the other, loving the creator, trying to understand the creator, the self and the other at the same time. Right. Um, sure. So that, that's something which is, which is on the one hand animated, I think the hearts of Nat of healthy people in all parts of the world in, in sure. Asia. And, and we could find examples of this in, in deep history and in, in all cultures. And then an opposing other thing that tends towards, um, a, a more arrogant, prideful, ego-based way of looking at the world based on a might makes right philosophy mm -hmm. and a much more selfish um, mode of conduct that has seen that it's more useful in their in in this other faction's worldview to keep the masses in some form of a cave structure, believing in shadows right. uh, by some oligarchical master class right um and and just always fighting each other being made dumber being made more mm -hmm. in, in enmeshed with the senses and i don't remember the specific example of the case he you says, brought up. i'll read it he says the point is illustrated by the case of thales associated associate anaximenes everyone knows that anaximenes specify air to be one of the primary constituents of all substance Yet the Greek term, which Oxford and Cambridge in particular have certified to signify air, has approximately the same meaning as the modern German geist, mind, or spirit, more precisely defined by context of usage. The fraud is so blatant, he goes on to say, that the translator who perpetuates it shows that he is engaged in writing hoax in writing a hoax. So is he saying that that Thales more appropriately rather than placing error as a cause a causal principle should we should have understood him to say mind instead of air since it's a synonymous term or are we no, are, I, think it, something I, different? I think he's saying that that was being co mind or spirit when he was actually saying air that the air is one of the primary con you know constituents of all of all substance mm. i don't think I mean, he was saying mind but maybe i'm wrong may because he says that it, it now the the term has now been certified to signify air, then now it has the same modern uh, definition as the German Geist, mind or spirit. Hmm. I will have to reserve judgment on that till I okay. really want it some more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Fair enough. Um. I I would have to go back and see what I think Anaximenes was referencing when he talks about air. Um. But I don't think that he was referencing mind or spirit. That doesn't, mm. it doesn't resonate for me what I remember of Anaximenes. I mean, I haven't read Anaximenes since ninth grade. I've school, never so. read Anaximenes. Oh. And I've, I've also not really, I've only read about Thales, maybe because I don't, okay. I think we only have some fragments. But he yeah. lived 
Um, I don't. I think around the time of Solon, uh, or so, maybe even a, yeah. a little bit before Solon. So this is like 200 years before Plato um, was active. Um, yeah, I'm not really too sure about that, but definitely Thales was was awesome, as was Solon. Yeah. Right? That's for sure. I, but I, as far as yeah, the, these Oxford's Cambridge, German University, uh, olig- like these oligarchs will just infiltrate and co-opt anything that they well, can. Wait. I yeah. interpreted it was that, I mean, this is a way that we can, uh, it, I, I think that they can, in, they can inject kind of a, a Gnostic view, uh, that it's through like this, uh, the mind spirit that is, uh, you know, kind of, that has the secret knowledge, but not, I, I mean, and we should discuss mm. this because I think there's different, different meanings of that, right? Mm. Like the, very much what he seems to be suggesting is that uh, Plato was trying to reveal this knowledge and that the elites, the quote unquote elites, these uh, like the British intelligence is specifically who he's referencing here, knew the the classics and they but they weaponized it. So it's not the, the, the knowledge itself that's evil. It was how it was being restricted from the masses and how it was being weaponized against the masses. And mm. I mean, I, I will say we can definitely see this in that if you look around most teachings today, and I think this is really, uh, I would say almost world, worldwide, although maybe not completely, but definitely in the West, they don't teach the classics anymore unless you're part of a very elite education you don't get access to the classics. You don't even have, and you're told they're not important, that they're anachronistic and that there's no reason to. Uh, I'm yeah, shocked yeah. how few people have ever read the classics. So, um, but I I don't know. I mean, I don't see, yeah, again, I haven't read Anaximenes since ninth grade, but I, I did read him then and that doesn't resonate with what I remember of him. So, uh, yeah, no, on the on those two points, yeah, that definitely we, we, often don't appreciate what happened to our education system. But one of the key points of the battleground is was waged, especially after World War II. I mean, it was always it was always a battleground, always. But it really, we took a big loss. But I, I say we like humans, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, um, where we had a reform that was carried out under this new um, reconfiguration of society around the idea that no longer would we try to value citizens as far as what an education system would would create, which was, mm-hmm. you know, the, the former value structure of the educational curricula was right. that we want whole citizens that could otherwise, you know, under, like play a role in society as, as something they would specialize in later on, become mm-hmm. a mechanic, become an engineer, become a doctor, whatever. But you, you wanted to first give somebody that whole integrated um, identity by by studying the Greek the Greek classics by studying Greek per se as a language and Latin that was yep. more normal to study that in even in even elementary school and high school yep. um, in some cases Sanskrit it, for some of the the better regular universities in in Europe for the masses were studying Sanskrit like the Humboldt system was that was a big part of what Alexander and and uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt brought in as well as an integration of the sciences and and music and the arts. There was an idea that you have to integrate that so that there's uh, an ability to see the art in the science and the science in the art and a, and a quality of rigor of going to original sources instead of just reading about something. So all of those those qualities, constructive geometry, don't memorize formulas, but but go right. and, and work on geometrical con- construction. And now they discourage that. That was yeah, all yeah. It was cr- but And now the new math was brought in. Yep. The you know the idea of just memorizing mathematical formulae was was brought in instead. That's the new math in the '60s under the OECD under people like Alexander King who are overseeing the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And that's the same guy who was a cyberneticist, an occultist. Yep. In my assessment, he was an occultist, yep. calling himself a, a Platonist, but he wasn't. Just like all of these these theosophists and and you know they all call themselves that because they like the structure of right. what Plato was saying in the Republic, pretty much. Right. Um, as far as like a society animated by golden souls and bronze souls and silver souls that have a caste structure. Now, that's what Plato is saying in the Republic. It's true. Yep. They like that structure because Plato is describing something that has already existed in sort of putting, saying out loud what you're not supposed to say out loud. He's right. showing you how the sausages are made. Right. <laughs> right. Which, <laughs> and but so there they like that part of it. And what Alexander King did also, you know working with Julian Huxley at the, at UNESCO 
Mm -hmm. um, was they brought in this idea that, okay, we're going to stop breeding dead white European males because they're yep. part of the old patriarchy that's been holding us back from our true selves. And we, we haven't been able to self-actualize and protect nature. And because of our adherence to old white dead European males like Dante. And so we're going to get rid of all of that and read more relevant thinkers who are more like ex reflective of the cynical, ugly reality of our age, like Sartre mm -hmm. and, you know, Theodore Adorno and the Frankfurt School and Heidegger, and they're all more like practical thinkers. And yeah. so, uh, you know, then that became the, the thing that sort of fed all of these black liberation theology, feminist, liber eco-feminist liberation. Then you have these subdivisions of this sort of weird, uh, fr you know, thing right that just became wokest garbage that made everybody confused and now everybody's like you know being told as young people that uh you could pick your own pick pick any of the 198,000 genders that we <laughs> I, I created and codified scientifically because you feel that way right so all that to say it's radical empiricism gone awry all based yeah. on this this conscious top down cutting off of the the method of thinking this platonic method of revisiting your axioms, going thinking in a dialectic fashion, thinking mm -hmm. in the, from the standpoint of discovery instead of memorization, and um, as far as the uh, the work of Plato per se, like yeah, the the Republic itself again when you read it, it's it's written in the form of like what is it twelve books, yeah, and it's written. Within for the intention that Plato had, which all of his dialogues are animated by the intention of shaping the curriculum of his academy. Right. And so his academy that he was overseeing was like the first major academy that was very political. It was like both generating generals and leaders and statesmen and sending out advisors that were coming out of this process. Yeah. Um to that 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 had a better appreciation for the topography of epistemological warfare of the battleground of ideas in a world that was animated by the delphic cults the different cult systems of mystery religions that were shaping the control and the growth of things like the babylonian empire that had only recently taken control of the persian empire through cyrus the great and had only recently started utilizing their control over persia as the march lord of babylon to dominate the world kind of like the u.s has been used under the control of of great britain and the hellfire club types over the last you know decades well let's say since jfk was killed especially but it's it's always been a thing it's always been a problem that's the that was the relationship back then and so there was a real world that plato was living in trying to help his students the you know oh those are yeah, a yeah. great translation i don't know if, who made who, Is it? Those are the shory translations fowler lamb okay those are some good translations okay um, yeah, the Loeb Classic Library has some good good translations, I've noticed. Um, Great. So, yeah, like, like he's writing this not as a program of what do you do to rule society, which would horrify your average person, be like, because it comes out with yeah. these terrible outcomes, but the, right. the idea <laughs> of what is justice. And that's the whole pursuit is like, what is justice? Let's try to find it in the individual. If it's too tough to make sense of what individual uh, justice is purely by looking at individuals, let's take a step back and look at a whole city and maybe it'll become more clear what it is. But then he has to do th like thought experiments. It's a thought experiment to say, okay, well, how do we build up our city? What type of um, guardians, leaders uh, will be in our city? If so, how do we, how do we create guardians who are reliable leaders? And they're, and so the whole thing is a, is a series of experiments based on hypotheses and you follow through to see where the hypotheses will lead you, whether or not you've examined it correctly or not. And in the case of the Guardians, that's one of the big Achilles heels where it's one of the only times in all of Plato's dialogues where he, he allows an unexamined assumption to slide in there where, you know, they're like, well, how do you train dogs or how do you breed, breed dogs or breed, uh, racehorses you 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 breed them like he, and he gets basically you you find the best of the stock you make them have sex with each other they'll produce something something similar or better and you just do that as selective breeding he's basically d describing you know a, a eugenics darwinian you know mm -hmm. system of pavlovian and also yeah pavlovian as well very behaviorist you got to get yeah. and and so they never questioned the the axiom which was made very clear are human beings and dogs the same, or is there a different set of rules? Because they, they, 
it's presumed in that in that section that it's the same thing. And so if, if you assume that humans and animals are the exact same thing, then a bunch of things will will flow um, right. that will take you into fascism. Even though you yeah. had the noble intention at the start, you'll, you, you will become that conclusion. And that's yep. where the, the Blavatsky, any Bassant, John Ruskin, all of these so-called Neoplatonists, they like that part. <laughs> they like a society of breeding out the unfit and controlling a society based on creating illusions by a master class. But it's not Plato. Plato is actually, if you take both what he's doing in the, the Republic within the context of why he's doing it, and you also then take into consideration all of his other dialogues, right. and especially book one of the Republic, where he's like, you know, disputing with Thrasymachos, the mm -hmm. this, like Nietzschean character of might makes right, you know, the, the maximum good is the maximum evil. Uh, the, the maximum ability to like feed my sensual pleasures and destroy my enemies, that's the maximum good and the maximum bad evil is is just uncomfort or pain for the body and and socrates dismantles that and demonstrates that that is not possibly true that's the master key to hold on to in, after getting through book one into book two three four five six seven and eight and all of the other dialogues in the republic or the the, the chapters um which a lot of people again they don't do because they're told to just take a part out of context they read just, secondary sources they don't read the the primary source um, I mean, I, I, I've encountered this so many times, even from people who I would consider quite erudite, like they will tell me, you know, I will bring in, you know, material, like even quotes. And yes, that's out of context, but it's quotes from the original source. And they'll tell me, oh, Corny, I can't read original source philosophy. I'm like, well, then don't debate with me on philosophy if you can't read the original source. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm saying let's discuss what was actually said. Let's not, you know, extrapolate from a, uh, you know, secondary interpretation of what was said, because now we're already further removed. I mean, it's hard enough to read somebody's writing and then interpret what in first person what they meant, you know, especially mm -hmm. somebody who lived, you know, we're talking about millennia uh, from where we are today. So it's a completely different world and different framework. Um, mm -hmm. So, But yeah, I, most people don't read the original source, so they have no context for what you know, what, what is being said. I think that's really interesting. What you're talking about though, is this cherry picking. Uh, that's really what I see. Like the, what you were talking about with this, uh, you know, the one axiom that slid through and it's really, it was a thought experiment. And, you know, the point is the differentiation between humans and dogs. And that laid the groundwork for so much of what has shaped our society today, I would argue, by the Malthusian, you know, powers that shouldn't be. But you see this through, like, John Stuart Mill. You see this through uh, Wilhelm Bond, who shaped the future of education, psychology, all the mm -hmm. social sciences, uh, you know, Pavlov, as I mentioned. Um, but that's so much of where uh, things have been I think misinterpreted today, but they they ran with that, and now they're attributing it to Plato. And I think the reason that's significant is because if you can now, you know, demonize, for lack of a better word, uh, the the person who created it as an ex exercise, then people don't investigate any further. And now the the whole purpose of the thought experiment is kind of. Uh, taken out of context, and it's being used as a, a weapon against society. Yeah, and you absolutely. Can't uncover any of that because you're you've only cherry picked this one component. Absolutely, no. There, there's always any what is it? Uh, any text out of context is pretext. So, mm -hmm. context is really everything on so many levels. And we've I've got I guess we've just gotten a little bit lazy because we want now right answers. We're encouraged to want right answers from early on in school. You know, you get rewarded in school you for having the right answer. So the the even if the question was never generated in your mind, what the, what what was the question that the answer is answering? It doesn't right. matter. You go to the back of the book. You know, you go to Cliff's notes to read about what is the gist of what Shakespeare is saying in Othello instead of reading Shakespeare's Othello, which one might give they might give you similar results when you're answering a, a multiple cho choice test. Sure. However, one actually has a transformative power. Right. Because you've yeah. thought about something that is beyond you. You've made a discovery of something in, in, in a mind of somebody somebody who has earned excellence as far as a Shakespeare um, mind quality, who is generated as a creator, this incredible, powerful metaphorical art, which is not just symbolic, but specific in its metaphorical nature because there's like intention that you can discover 
that by you know through through the type of work um within the scenes within the acts in the in the shakespearean dialogue and learn something uh, very deep about the universal attributes of yourself what would cause yes. you to become more corrupt or become a non-tragic as a person like all of you get insights into how the venetian operations work by reading othello or the merchant of venice you'd learn learn about you get insight as a citizen that would make you more powerful and transform from being something ignorant to something not ignorant about matters of, of high importance versus the cliff's notes right answers so all that to say i think that yeah we, we've been encouraged a little bit too much in that um to get to give us a false sense of pride pride is a big one because you feel like you have knowledge of something because you right. read the wikipedia entry or you you know but you actually didn't earn it so it's like you don't really have the true knowledge that you think you do. And that's the worst kind, as Plato points out in the, the Socrates apology, the last yes. year, where Socrates is saying, look, I, the reason why I'm on trial and I'm about to possibly be killed by the, de by the democracy party under accusations that I'm corrupting the minds of the youth is simply not that I was trying to disprove the pantheon of pagan gods. I'm not trying to corrupt them. I'm just simply trying to get at, well, what is true? Yeah. And you know, do I am I'm aware that I'm ignorant of of pretty much everything. He who knows but, knows he knows nothing. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And, but I'm in a better place than all of the lawyers and the experts and the specialists and all the fields who I, I I wanted to talk with, thinking that I would know more by talking with the experts. And I discovered in really just asking them questions that they didn't really know the things that they thought they knew. Where and but but they were in a worse place than me because they thought they knew what they didn't know. Whereas I know that what I don't know. So I guess I am wiser in that sense. And they you know, were indoctrinated. Like, huh? Because they were indoctrinated in modern day sense. Oh, yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> and they, you know, the, the demos ultimately chose to um to give them the, the hemlock um as 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 a gift for and you know or as punishment for uh, for his attempt to try to help them think for themselves. Yep. Um uh so th there's that. And the other thing with, with the whole, um, going back to source material, like when you, yeah. when you read the, um, the works of a, of a Plato, um, you're, you're, you're finding your, your own mind increasingly honed with an ability that is more than the words because you're, 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 he's cultivating an instinct for smelling, uh, bullshit. So yeah. You're looking for sophistry. You're looking for where where am I going to encounter arts of or acts of of sophistry of 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 the of of, of of logical syllogisms that are utilized with with emotionally charged methods yep. that are manipulative to make the false appear true and the true appear false. How can I identify that? How can I get people instead of just hearing like what I'm doing right now is I'm doing a little bit of a non platonic thing, right? I'm just kind of like ranting. That's not play right. with that, right? You know, you're you're <laughs> We're both agreeable people who are kind of on the same page. So there's no real point right. to necessarily <laughs> engage in a platonic dialogue in that sense. But all that to say, you know, you're it you're forces you're the other person to engage in critical thought processes where yeah. they're they're not in a position of necessarily being. This is not like the modern day where if you uh, you only talk to you know the echo chamber or you know if somebody doesn't agree, then somehow they're you know inherently evil or inherently wrong or you know mm -hmm. there's no nuance and people really have lost people say the debate is not productive and i think in some cases because people have lost the actual art of debate that that might be true um because people start you know resorting to ad hominems and there's no actual rhetoric and they they don't have the ability to uh create cogent arguments and moreover they don't have the ability to use logical deductive reasoning uh, you know, we, we either in the moment or reflectively. Yes. And I, I think that that's why, you know, we are, and that's a byproduct of our dumbing down of society, you know, and I think yeah, that yeah. was totally intentional. Yeah. Um, and I think it was really evil. Um, when yes. you talk about the trial of Socrates, that, that impacted me so much. Like, I remember just bawling my eyes out through that. Um, I wrote a paper, it was for my English class, my sophomore year of high school. And it was like, we... I, I we, we were very fortunate. We got to write like book reports essentially once a month. That was kind of like our fun for the class. And that was one of the book reports I did. And my ninth grade history teacher actually published it. 
um, my book report. I didn't know until my senior year of high school, actually. I was like in the bathroom. Some girl was like, are you Courtney Turner? And I said, yeah, why? She, I just quoted you from my paper. You're a secondary source. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I had no idea. Nobody told me until then. Yeah. But it had such a profound impact on me because yeah. I felt like through so much of my education, I was constantly, you brought up like geometry, for instance. And, you know, instead of working through the problem, like I, when I worked through geometry, I actually loved geometry. Um, but when I would work through it, I would kind of re reverse engineer. It was like puzzles to me, but I would get in trouble because I didn't, you know, it wasn't done through memorizations of the, hmm. of, you know, the proofs and the, the equations essentially. Hmm. Um, but to me, that didn't, that wasn't really important. I mean, if that's helpful, I, I'm not saying that they, they have no value, but mm -hmm. if you're able to actually work through it, that has so much more value. This is the same reason why they've taken phonics out of reading because mm -hmm. yes, the mother's primer look, see method of reading is very useful for somebody who's deaf. This is why it's, you know, they don't have the auditory processing skills. And this is why it was a great, uh, you know, thing for Gallaudet to pick up, but for, people who do have those senses, it, it's incredibly devastating because now they don't have the, the components that make up the whole. So they can't work through the material. They can't work through the sentence and oh. construct it themselves. They're just, they see it as a whole. So you, you have no idea how you got to the whole. And this is, I think, just really detrimental to all huh. critical thought and all really just all of society. So Right on, eh? Yeah, I didn't really think about it that way. That's a good point. Yeah, no, it, there's so many, there's so many ways that this is that our, our education system has just become so broken by design. They they consciously chose to break it. That's a beautiful painting. Um, the 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 thing, right? And so, for anybody who hasn't, take this time to take note. If you're listening to this 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 yeah, this discussion right now, <laughs> right now in the trial and death of Socrates, um, featuring at least at least the apology, the credo, and the Philebus, uh, the 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 the, the Phaedo, sorry, the Phaedo which is the, the day he drinks the hemlock. And it's the yeah. discussion on the immortality of the soul. The, the credo is about the question of law and should Socrates, is it best that he take the bribe that credo, his wealthy uh, friend made to the guards to like leave and live out his days in like Syracuse, or should he just, just simply stay and follow through with the pu punishment of the demos doled out, doled out upon him. Right. Um, and he chooses through a, a long, reasonable discourse, and it's a challenging one, that it's yep. best to, to choose to stay, even though he could live out another 10, 20 years. Um, and people should, like, really wrestle with that. And then finally, yes. like I said, the immortality of the soul, which is pr probably my favorite dialogue of all of them on the, 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 the Fado dialogue. Yeah. Um, super important. And again, when you when you read these things, you 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 be. And you're taking notes too. You're active reading, not just passive reading. And people right. are like writing down their notes, their own thoughts that are necessarily going to be awoken as you're reading these challenging uh, paradoxes. How do you how do you smell out a paradox? How do you zero in on an anomaly that doesn't fit when you take a hypothesis and you map it onto reality? Where yep. does where does the mapping break? Though that break, the singularities, the paradoxes. That's the goal. That's the that's the source of your future discovery. If you if you get in the habit of moving the mind that way, whereas the 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 the, the shitty way of brainwashing people but calling it not giving them knowledge, is by what we we've been doing is you yep. you encourage them to take accepted standard models of things that experts all agree upon as a way to explain some phenomenon. Tell people to like memorize as much as possible whatever that those those explanatory models might be. Right. And then try to fit reality into those models, even if the reality starts demonstrating that there's there's actions that are totally not explicable by the model, whether it's in, in cosmology, astrophysics, microphysics, whatever, biology, mm -hmm. virology, <laughs> just fit the universe into your model, constrain it the way your mind is constrained by your own lack of creativity because you've been broken based on this, this putting the mind into this false mold. That's the Aristotelian, but not only the Aristotelian, it could also have other variations of pseudo Aristotelian, which is also the same in my mind as pseudo platonic or, or I think so too. there's a lot of overlap there. And uh, the thing I really wanted to just get at with the, uh, the Republic. Yes. Oh, that's a beautiful painting by a French painter. Uh, oh yeah. That, that's great. I forgot his name. The, the Republic 
it not only did it, it it's it's literal interpretation inspire so much so many bad people or at least yeah. maybe not inspire them so much as like gave them a guideline around which they wanted to do things that they were going to do. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like people, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of like, I, I forgot what they're called, but uh, I'm totally blanking on the word, but the people who use revelations as a blueprint, right? Um, uh, the immunization, yeah. immunization of the eschaton, and they, they use revelation as a blueprint to, to yeah. bring that about. That, you know, that's not the, I mean, regardless of your, you on the you know the bible and revelations but there are people who use that in order to bring about the you know end end times yeah. um i think it's very similar yeah yes, it is, so is very very similar you're right and and you know again like i was saying the they would be doing what they do as far as organizing society the way the way you see it documented in plato's republic they would already be doing that even if plato hadn't been writing the republic what plato did is he took something that had already been done thousands of years even before him and is just the natural way that the oligarchy has organized itself to manage society using all of the techniques that Plato like lays out for everyone to read. That's yeah. what they've been doing. They, they would still be doing it, except now they, they have like um, a formal, a formalized structure that they're ultimately trying to co-opt and undo from within for the public. So the public doesn't see what Plato is actually doing by calling themselves and the evil that they do play, platonic. Now, what I was going to say though, in contrast to that, is that if you read the writings of the people who like did the most good as far as unleashing creative progress and liberty for humanity, and I'm here I'm speaking about the works of people like read the the, the Commonwealth by Cicero, um, mm -hmm. fighting to keep the, Ro Rome from becoming an empire um, under the mystery cults that he was battling in his time as a Platonist. He was asked like, "Are you a what are you? Are you a?" Uh, are you, are you a Stoic? Are you an Epicurean? Because that's what everybody was supposed to fit themselves into. And he's like, no, I'm neither one of those things. I am a Platonist. He wrote his laws. He wrote his Commonwealth. He wrote all of his works, most of them in dia uh, Platonic dialogue format. And the content is sort of inspired by Plato's Republic and laws in his own in his own works, like 250 years later. And then Augustine in the City of God is directly... Um, self-aware he's a self-aware platonist he's mostly writing in platonic dialogues in his right. free choice of the will and his against academicians and his against aristotle and all of these things and saint augustine in his city of god is again retooling in, a, in an authentic platonic fashion what plato is do is attempting to do with the republic as a study of human nature of, of government of everything else there you go yeah marcus T tullius cicero had his head cut off um, by by uh, a certain figure who uh, really really hated him called Mark Antony, who was a big part of like launching Rome into a civil war that gave rise to uh, the empire. Um, they also, were brutal to their enemies back then. I mean, not that they're not today, but it was yeah, you got beheaded. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was yeah. And, but and again, like the 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 founding fathers of the American Republic, you know, the the fact that America was set up by pl mostly Platonists. If yep. you look at Ben Franklin, you look at a lot of the key the key players who This moved. is so important because it's so yeah. being weaponized right now. Um, yeah. You know, I'm seeing, uh, you know, I know you're not in Canada, but you're, uh, you're in Canada. You're not an American, so that, that's worth noting. But you're very versed in, uh, you know, the history, probably more so than many Americans, unfortunately. Um, but what I'm seeing right now is this dialectical, uh, you know, that's dialectical poll that's intentionally trying to subvert the American constitution. And, mm -hmm. and you're hearing this constantly from, uh, you know, the, the so-called uh, right that, that, you know, the enlightenment was evil and it's uh, the root of all the problems we're seeing today. And, you know, it's uh, it's liberalism that got us here. Uh, and they're, they're including classical liberalism in this, which I think was totally conflated. And, you know, this is the manipulation of linguistics. Um, which I think is very much at play. And I think that's one of the uh, masteries of these uh, cults and the occult is to manipulate the language, to cast spells. I think that's why it's called spelling, you know, <laughs> um, or at least that the, there's some correlation there, if not the, the causality. But you see this so much. And it's uh, I, I think it's be because, again, as you pointed out, we live in the soundbite society. Everything is so fast paced. And now it's not just, you know, the radio and, uh, you know, the papers and uh, 
of course, film, television, but now we have social media. And it's literally people see a tweet and they think they suddenly know everything about the subject. And uh, 140 characters, although I know with the blue check marks, you get more than that. But, you know, you're still not going to get the gist of it as a... Uh, as thoroughly as if you were to digest the material yourself and the enlightenment was not all one synonymous school of thought i mean that's just it's it's kind of like saying that mm -hmm. all the Pla platonists and especially the neoplatonists that they were all in agreement with each other which mm -hmm. i i don't think is a hundred percent true um and i think that the uh you know i think that we're, and i'd love to hear your thoughts on this but the neoplatonists and the aristotelians i do see them as kind of another dialectical pole but it's marching towards the same agenda there may have been competing factions but i think the end goal is still this same kind of rule and enslavement creating a neo feudal society here on earth um but with the Enlightenment, I mean, there was, I, I always ask people, I'm like, which Enlightenment? You know, the Scottish Enlightenment was radically different from, uh, you know, a lot of the, like the, certainly the German, the British and the French Enlightenment. And the counter Enlightenment, I think, is, you know, very much an extension of a lot of this Neoplatonic kind of thought, maybe even uh, the ancient mystery school religions. Mm -hmm. And very different from, uh, you know, some of the other schools of Enlightenment thought. And mm -hmm. I think they're much of what's being propagated today and much of what's problematic about what we're experiencing today. Mm -hmm. But the soundbite is that the Enlightenment is the root of all evil. And, the, yeah. you know, on the other side, you have the quote unquote left, the Marxists. And, you know, of course, they're the counter Enlightenment. But they, they've been subverting the Constitution since, I would argue, the inception of the Constitution. So. Yeah, no, it, well, it, the, the whole idea of ages, um, mm -hmm. there's the, that is, I think, a part of, um, it's something that, that has been a bit of a brainwashing technique of mm -hmm. our society. Like, you, you could choose to categorize, you know, the, the human experience into periods. Right. And, and, and put those periods under a label and call it, like, the Baroque period that preceded the Romantic period, right. you know? You have the modern period and then the postmodern period, and yeah. then you know you the, the scholastic period before that, and then the, you had the Renaissance period, which is defined by by these dates on a timeline. And anybody who was like a, alive and active during that time, artist or philosopher or statesman, was if they were was that a representative of that time of that period, right? Right, or or Enlightenment as well. If you're born within the period of whatever sixteen. 50 to what is it uh, 1803 or something whatever okay. you're all an enlightenment thinker but it's like no there's there's vicious battles yeah. between people born in and, and living in as contemporaries those periods who obviously Doesn't our current time show you that <laughs> you think yeah. humanity has somehow changed like yeah you know and then you find people are very much on the same on the same wavelength who are born in and live in two very different periods separated by hundreds or thousands of years. Right. So it's like, how do you define, you know, like whether, you know, you read um, Friedrich Schiller or mm. Percy Bysshe Shelley, the, you know, a British poet or a, a German, a German poet, scholar, philosopher, as was Shelley actually. So they're both po poet philosophers. Um, and, find a, a, a differentiation of the quality of how their minds work, what method they're using to tackle problems and to generate solution concepts and express beauty in artistic, uh, creative, uh, works. Yep. Look as how is that different from the type of method that we find in the way Da Vinci is showing his mind works by reading his notebooks and looking at the fruits of his discoveries or, you know, the way that, Augustine's mind is working when you read his City of God or his various works. It's it's like it's the, it's a very it's the same wavelength. It's the same method, though adapted to their own times. They're not not wearing the same kind of clothing, speaking right. the same kind of language. So everything material is different, but there is a common universe universality in this in in the in how their minds work to move from ignorance into understanding, and then act upon that new understanding with an ability to utilize an earned power of transformation of the self and of the world around you. So it's this like reciprocal ability to one, make a discovery by going from transforming a state of ignorance into knowledge, which is the, pr the purpose of all platonic dialogues, whether it's the cradleist on the nature of like, what is the relationship of ideas and language and, and mm -hmm. is ideas the subject of and bounded by the language we use or does the language itself 
reflect and evolve according to the ideas that we have, you know, yes, but he doesn't tell you that explicitly. He gives you a bunch of paradoxes to showcase where the false hypotheses break down in the cradleus or the same thing for the Philebus on the nature of, of devotion and love or the Theotetus on the idea of what is knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Uh, ver like real knowledge versus the fake, the fake knowledge, the wind eggs wearing the, 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 the surface appearance of it, but not the real thing. So they're all doing that. Uh, it's within, such important pilot. conversation for what we're witnessing today. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. <laughs> How else are you going to be able to navigate through this misinformation minefield run by intelligence exactly. agencies that are creating different models that are seductive, that participate in truths on certain levels, but have Trojan horses embedded to make you either impotent in, in affecting any type of change that you would otherwise want to stop empire from killing you and everyone you love, or to make you even on the worst hand, as you alluded to with, with how a lot of the conservatives and their reactionary liberals or vice versa are all being herded um, to become weaponized so that the thing that you hate is what you end up inadvertently participating in yeah. as the, the Jacobin mobs were doing in the, in the bloody terror of the French revolution that, you know, could have become, it could have become um, a beautiful, good, you know, first official Republic liberated of, of hereditary powers on the continent of Europe after the American experience, it could have been that, but the British were very sophisticated. Their Venetian operations were very, very sophisticated through the different Masonic lodges, the Martinist lodges, that worked make, to make sure that it turned instead of, of being a viable revolution based on universals into a, a Jacobin bloodbath um, where the mobs were weaponized by rabble rousers, demagogues like Jacobin and Robespierre, and, uh, sorry, Robespierre and, and Marat and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of them um, that were on the payroll of, of Bentham and the British Foreign Office to just yeah. basically kill all the leaders, everybody good and everybody bad alike, all lost their heads. So all the all the collaborators of Ben Franklin who made the American Revolution possible operating through the Grand Orient Lodge system, which had a faction that seemed to have been actually taken control of by a humanist platonic grouping that were yeah. that Benjamin Franklin had had really organized since the 1740s in France, in Russia in across the United States to help help make the thing called 1776 possible that was at war with the British United Grand Lodge of Freemasonry right like yeah. even the 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 official um horror academics for the for the British Empire proofs of conspiracy yeah by John Robison I don't know if that's yeah I did I got to revisit that. It's been years since I looked at that. So uh, George Washington actually used proof of the conspiracy to warn the American populace about the infiltration of the Illuminati into the Masonry. Um, and so there was another book. It's called Code of the Illuminati. And uh, Thomas Jefferson used that book as his warning yeah. about the infiltration. So. Yeah, I, I just I'm not persuaded that the. Uh, I'm not persuaded that it wasn't. Um, an operation itself. I'm not. I'm oh, not sure. interesting. Okay. It's hard to say because when you look at a lot of the Illuminati, like research material that's available around Weistop and yeah. the Bavarian groupings, a lot of it comes from really questionable sources. Like the like the majority of the letters that we have that are I think incited by Robison, um, describe how you had a postman who was like carrying letters and he got hit by lightning. And then people found his dead body in all of these letters. And that's how we have these letters. And it's like, no, that's not how things happen. Um, they're, they're, that seems like a little bit of a myth making. So I don't know anymore exactly about mm. that. I'm, I'm reserving judgment. But I'll have to say, yeah, if people say I don't believe in conspiracy theories, it's like, well, the American Revolution was made on both an understanding that conspiracies are real the founding yeah. fathers were all conspiracy theorists, and rightfully so, because they were also making a conspiracy for the good. It's not always for the bad. So right. conspiracy, because sometimes you can't just say out loud everything you want to do because, you know, people will kill you and undermine right. your plans if you go and show all of your cards at the poker table, you know? And, and so secrecy for good or for bad is often needed um, to carry out plans in the real world where grownups live and try to, like, do things based on their concepts of, of right and wrong. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the 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 bad guys are much better, <laughs> are much more sophisticated most of the time uh -huh. um, at doing this uh, than the, yes. the the good guys have been. Although although we're here talking right now, and it we wouldn't be here, you know, with the life expectancy we have using technology that 
you know, Ben Franklin discovered using the, his mind, um, discovering the, the nature of electricity and, and all of the, the – so there, there's all of this and having just the liberty to have this conversation that in feudal times, sure. forget about it. We'd be illiterate if we were born 800 years ago, statistically pr- speaking, most likely. Like 99% of the people, you know, were, who were born into poor families were not expected to learn how to read. There wasn't really a lot of education for that in the feudal times. So, you know, we had a lot of – we had a life expectancy of maybe like 42 years of age. Like, you know, worse than even Molly. Um, so like this is this is because the oligarchy actually doesn't have the type of godlike power that they want to project into our psyche. <laughs> right. that we think that there's nothing we can do because we're here right now with all these liberties that have been fought for and died for by creative people who thought on that higher level. I, I always think that's so ironic, the people who are criticizing the Enlightenment. I'm like, the the fact that you are here criticizing it, and most of them are using technology to do so, uh, I'm like, both of those things would not be true if uh, the Enlightenment not, had not happened. So it's a, a little, you know, oxymoronic, in my opinion. But, um, but that's really interesting about the Illuminati. I'm going to have to now revisit because I did read uh, Robeson's book. I read Code of the Illuminati as well. And I do think there's a lot of elements of truth in it. Uh, both of them were written by insiders. And I often think insiders actually reveal more because they're writing from a favorable position. Uh, you know, kind of like Carol Quigley, Tragedy of Hope, I think divulged way more than any critic would have. Um, but you know, the, the, the origins of the sources. Yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, like I said, it's something I'm, I'm only now beginning to re-question myself and reevaluate yeah. a little bit more uh, with, uh, but, but I, like for me, I know that um, by looking at the work, especially of Graham Lowry, um, who did mm-hmm. one of the most essential studies of, of pre pre American revolutionary uh, history from 1630 yeah. to like 1757. Um, his work really took it so deep into a study of the occult and the Hellfire Club operations within both Britain, but also within the colonies um, okay. that were, were spreading out in. Sure. Really, I mean, the Hellfire Club was officially set up in that incarnation. It obviously existed in, in other incarnations before that because sure. it's just a it's a Rosicrucian Kabbalist, you know, syncretization of it's basically Satanism. Right. But it, it but it's yeah. it. This has always been there. It was infused into Britain from Venice when Venice had had orchestrated a sort of uh, takeover of Amsterdam of, of England in the early part of the the 16th century. It, it had been sort of they had had an operation like an outpost, a pillar inside of England, really mm-hmm. going back to the Norman invasion of, of 1066. That was also right. integral for that played into the Crusades as well and the growth of the Templar order. Um so that that was already sort of a an, an instrument of Venetian controls. Also, there's another city state uh, called the Malfi, which had yeah. less, less power, but it was tied to Venice in a in a serious way. A lot of the leading Roman patrician families from the Western Empire remigrated to those two two of those key zones. As Venice became the 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 core of the evil for a, for a few centuries. And, um, and, you know, it was these groupings, the, the feudal barons, the rebel barons that created things like the Magna Carta to enshrine the powers of the city of London as a yep. power unto itself outside of any type of law that could be created. That's what the whole free man idea was, was about. It wasn't about giving everybody freedom. It was about giving the feudal lords and the, the Norman the Norman robber barons the, the ability to be about, like, be God. Um, so... You know, the, the the there was always a battle inside of England, though, around the the better the just like you have the clash of the two Americas, you got the clash of the two Englands. You know, and I got a friend, uh, Jerry Therrien, and he gave a wonderful class, and he did an essay we 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 published on the Rising Tide Foundation on uh, the roots of the 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 Platonic Augustinian Britain, going back to the the true King Arthur from the the early sixth uh, century who was a real person who fought real battles in the real world, who was very much tied to all of these platonic Augustinian networks um, in, around the, the Welsh movements that was doing battle with the, the whole pagan revival of the occults uh, as Rome was, was splintering up and, and recombining itself. Um, it's somewhere on there. Um, that's the rising tide foundation site for those who have never seen it before. Um, yeah, it's somewhere down there, but you'll find it. It's got a picture of Ar- a, a, a statue of Arthur. Um, anyway, it'll, it'll come up, but, okay. um, 
But so you have both that tradition inside of England, which right. manifested in some really powerful people like the Platonists, the Thomas More and Erasmus. Thomas More mm -hmm. did his own republic in the fashion of the, the utopia um, before he yep. himself yep. also got killed the way Socrates and Cicero had gotten killed earlier by Henry VIII, who was being brainwashed by an occult Kabbalist Benedictine monk um, by the name of Francesco Zorzi. Um, who was setting the stage for the Venetian takeover of uh, of the English aristocracy. So a lot of these guys around, and it wasn't Thomas More by himself who got his head cut off when uh, when that was happening. He was, he was among a, a wide network of these Platonists who were purged. Um, but it still took a while. It, it, there was still, it had to incubate, you know, like a, like a virus inside of a host. It was still incubating, you know, and you had like back channel fighting, there were some good people that emerged onto the scene around the, the the British Civil War, who were able to take do some good things like like um, I won't drop names right now, but um, that was only like a ten year republic. It didn't last long. Huh. It, it was an attempt. It was like the first world attempt to create an, an actual republic. Although it was so full of 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 psyops and controllers, right. like even Oliver Cromwell was was a bit of an agent and became a uh, a dictator. He, he, he didn't, it didn't last long as a Republic. And so the, the, the people who were fighting for it, who were authentic, you know, Republicans, um, and, and again, people like John, uh, John Milton, who was actually not a Satanist. That's another, another person who's also been slandered because Milton did his paradise lost, which has also inspired some really bad people, who, yeah. who, but they, but they all hate and pretend that he didn't do paradise found, which is the, that's the part that they, they wish he never did because. Right. They want the Luciferian uh, triumph in the, the paradise lost, <laughs> but right. and in schools, literature. I've talked. I've spoken to literature literature professors. They didn't even know that. Yeah, John I didn't know that. I found where Christ prevails. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, I had never. I had never heard of pa Paradise Found. It's wild. Eh? It's like it's like imagine people just 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 reading Dante's Inferno and not knowing that there was a a a a, a, paradis, a paradisio, right? right. If, if that's how we, it's like that he wrote the the Inferno in order to set the stage for an understanding of the Purgatorio, in order to set the stage for the Paradisio. Right. But everybody likes the Inferno because we're living in a bit of a, a hellscape ourselves, so it it like appeals to our cynicism, our darkness. So we like that, and the oligarchy wants to pretend that that's all that that he wrote in some cases. But they did they did a better job with Milton. But Milton, my in my readings, this guy was was solid, um, really solid. And um, all that to say, the the there's this whole movement, right? That that directly provides a continuous thread as a unity, shaping all of the the known human experience around what Plato he Plato made it more explicit, though it existed before him. Look at Solon. Look at Thales. This this idea that human beings are made in the image of a god that we have to live with dignity, we have to fight empire and and enslavement. We we have to do that. That exists. That that goes back before Plato and cultures that didn't know Plato also, you know, understood that. And and you see sure. that's how to map out, you know, India's deep history or China's deep history and the battle of the different empires in in China. It, you got to look at that right, and and then appreciate well what was Confucius, and what did Confucius do when he was bringing online a body of knowledge. And he never, like Socrates, never wrote anything down. It was his disciples. They were right. administrators. They were trying to actually create philosopher kings in China, right? Right uh, around the Zhu Dynasty, and then later on, a lot of them came to power with the Han Dynasty that created the Silk Road in the first time around. But the, but the but but Socrates too didn't write anything down. It was his students, Plato and Xenophon, and others who were the ones actually trying to create philosopher kings with actual people in the real world, like, like Dionysus the second and, and Dion and, and so many others. Um, and working with, with like-minded people in Egypt around the temple of Amman, which at some, certain points was very corrupt. And at other points you had, uh, you had actually good people, uh, right. managing the temple of Amman. Right. And it, it's like everything, there's these battle of these two currents. So Britain, the same thing, England became the seat of a, of that empire at a certain point. Um, that was really, really the Hellfire Club took over and um and, and was brought online in the in the end of the, the 17th century, right. right around the same time that the that that you had the glorious revolution, right? 1680, 1688 was when the the Vene the, 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 the Venetians used their Venetian party of Lord John Churchill, the, the Duke of Marlborough, to right. end to to manage 
the 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 takeover of a of a puppet king from from the Netherlands who didn't even speak English installed that re-empowered the city of London that did a clamp down on on the colonies who had gained a lot of independence during the period of the Civil War of Britain. Mm -hmm. So during that time, the the colonies had a huge cotton mat. I mean, not cotton mather. Uh, John Winthrop Jr. and and others were really using that space of chaos of 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 in in England to create viable uh, independence movements around mm. which people like Cotton Mather, the guy who who recruited a young Ben Franklin when Ben Franklin was like seven years old, delivering candles for his father to the oh. local sort of communities in, in Massachusetts, or maybe it was Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Um, yeah. yeah. And so that's where he was recruited. Mather talks about it. Ben Franklin talks about it. And the problem was Cotton Mather and John Winthrop Jr. were at war with the Hellfire Club that was active within the colony, setting up Jap- branch chapters. And who was the person who set up the chapter in Philadelphia, it was Ben Franklin's older brother who ran the biggest publishing house in Philadelphia. That was the, that, that John Winthrop Jr. went out when he was like 89 years old into the streets and called out Ben Franklin's older, older brother, James, I think was his name, as a tool of the Hellfire Club. And that's documented. That's scholarly documentation calling that shit out. So this was like penetrating everything. It was like the British high command were by 1710 when the, when, Queen Anne died. That's the the caves, the the caverns under probably Medbenham ca- Castle or something. I guess. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that, but <laughs> but it was all done in these catacombs. Yes. And because it's a very Mithraic, Eleusinian mystery school that they were reviving. That's that's what the Hellfire Club was doing. Um, right. And even John Wilkes Booth's grandfather was a leading member of the damn thing, and he even said it in a in a, an interview in the 1770s that they were carrying out Eleusinian mysteries in the Hellfire Club crypts, right? And this is what Ben Franklin was deployed clearly. And, and Graham Lowry did a great job in his How the Nation Was One, going through the story in a lot of detail, triangulating in on what, how did Benjamin Franklin become a counter, uh, become involved in counter espionage? So he had to, he was deployed to go in and get a job, getting abused by his older brother in the printing house. That's where he got his start, you know, um, deployed by Cotton Mather. Mm-hmm. And John Winthrop um, to both get intel from the inside. He was ended. He ended up getting sent out to London in the 1720s, and uh, he clearly had. And there's a, a, a thorough, thorough proof that that has been created. I'm totally persuaded. Graham Lowry's method is rigorous, as as uh, you can't believe. Okay. That he went in to get intel and information on what was going on in the Hellfire Club headquarters within Britain itself. So he had to report back on what the hell was Britain doing, what was going on in the in the mother country in order to feed back into the Republican networks in America, which he then did. And you could look at their entire life before and after that period and how everything he did was devoted to breaking the Hellfire Club controls over not only the colonies, but the world as a whole, even to the point that he was able to recruit leading people through his scientific discoveries in, in not just, I mean, he discovered... The, the 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 currents of the the, the wind currents of the oceans. He, he discovered so many things. He was like a da Vinci, not a tinkerer, a da Vinci. And his work on electricity, he organized the, the elites even and was able to win over factions of the elites from their own hereditary powers, from Russia, from even from France, even from England, who uh, basically ushered in the Industrial Revolution of Manchester in the 1750s under Benjamin Franklin's Lunar Society. That was Benjamin Franklin's baby when he was the ambassador from Philadelphia to England that he set up the Lunar Society that found the best manufacturers, scientists, artists who he recruited to the cause of improving the people and the the, the situation of the people by infrastructure, paving roads, creating sanitation, training students to learn how to read the classics, all of these things, setting up new schools, new hospitals. That was that was what that was a Ben Franklin baby who drove the, the British industrial upgrade, which had to be corrupted later on and, you know, what have you. But Benjamin Franklin was everywhere. He was like the Plato of his day through his academy. What Plato was doing with his international network of, of, uh, of contacts. Right. Conspiracies in Egypt, in Sparta, in across the, the various city states of, of Greece in like, he was everywhere. Um, that's what Benjamin Franklin was doing. And so, you know, it's like, there's this whole interesting, wonderful heritage that that yeah. we are a part of that we have a right to know and the oligarchy has tried to rob us of that by giving this us these false constructs that say well, oh the american revolution was a freemasonic revolution it's all part of a plot to steal our freedoms 
yeah, that's that's from the Rise and Tide Foundation site. All of like as many of the book, works that I could find by Ben Franklin. Everybody should read wow. these beautiful, beautiful works by Ben Franklin and get to know the guy because he's so he's so wonderful. Um, and the narrative we're sold recently that I keep seeing seeing is that he was a member of the Hellfire Club and that he's a, he, well, he infiltrated it. He infiltrated right. it, but they, but see that's the thing, right? People don't know how to think about though. counterintelligence. They, 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 yeah. That's right. And, the, and there's like, look, look at Cooper's, uh, 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 James Fenimore Cooper wrote a wonderful novel called The Spy. And the, the spy, I mean, it was kind of bastardized in a, in a more recent show called, uh, you know, Turn, the, the Turn show on Netflix. I don't think I do. No. It's a show. It's actually a decent show, uh, but okay. it's about, I think they did two seasons of it. And it's about basically counterintelligence um, agents of the American cause of Washington that nobody knew who they were. Only like a couple of people around Washington knew who these people were. There were hundreds of them who mm -hmm. sacrificed their lives, their reputations to act like they were British loyalists. Right. But they were always working on the inside and, and they died. Most people don't know who they are. Yeah, that's the movie. It's great. Oh, uh, that's the show. Okay. A um, little, little overly romantic. But it, but basically it's taking what, J what James Fenimore Cooper is doing in this like 1820 book, The Spy. Okay. By showcasing just the getting us to appreciate the nature of counterintelligence and how many people, yeah, again, uh, are heroes who we don't even know who, right. in some cases, they were killed when they were found out doing high risk assignments inside of the inside of the the British territories, and in some cases, they lived out their lives hated by their families, their friends, because, and they died hated um, because they believed in the cause so much. Um, that right. they were willing to make that sacrifice. So people have forgotten that that's 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 part of what is a big part of our history is that aspect of things. And so it's hard for people to wrap their mind around how could Benjamin Franklin act like he was a member of such a thing, and then like somehow be a good guy. He must have killed the babies or the children who were found under the the ground. They say of the basement of the apartment he was staying at. It must have been him. And it's like yeah, there might have been children who were killed and whose bodies were found there. But he was going into an evil area, and God knows what the hell was already happening there before he got there. Um, right. And to just make this association that, oh, you know, <laughs> because he is involved in the thing, he must be doing all of those things. He must be bad. Right. It's this guilty by association thing yep. that really just scrubs people's minds. Yeah, and we see so much of that today. You know, this immediate guilt by association, and nobody bothers to investigate who the people are and what they're actually doing, and it's just an immediate tarnishing of reputation. Um, yeah. I have a couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, you mentioned it, and I think uh, Larouche mentioned it as well. He talks about Plato as a humanist, and I think we should, uh, you know, expound on that because uh, humanist for a lot of people today is associated with like human potential movement and Maslow. And I, I think that that was a uh, co-opted. It's not the same uh, for Plato and uh, I'll, I'll throw out a couple of things and then you can, yeah. you know, you'll, we'll go. And the other thing is uh, philosopher Kings. Cause I think this is something that has also been very much weaponized. Uh, people see they, they, and I think I, I could be wrong on this, but I think in some way it's the association to philosopher stone, which I think is a, a more, uh, you know, it's an alchemical uh, hermeticist uh, principle. And I, I think that does have more satanic uh, roots. And I think that it's the association of philosopher king, the philosopher stone that has uh, perpetuated this idea that the philosopher kings are these oppressors and, mm. uh, uh, you know, that they're Gnostic rulers. I don't know. I'd love your thoughts on that. But um, and then uh, to address uh who were the Lucinian uh, cult, and uh, maybe we'll talk a little bit about some of the the cults that were around at the time of Plato, and why it was that he felt the need to start an academy that, uh, you know, in my interpretation, was a way of trying to educate in a world where, you know, it's very different today, but I think it's a similar thing that's occurring where. Uh, you know, people have been dumbed down and knowledge has been withheld from them. And I think that this is something similar was occurring at that time. And mm -hmm. he was trying to provide a, a way that people could have access to a true education. The definition of education has even changed. You know, I, I don't have the exact definition in front of me, uh, but Charlotte Isabit went through like, you know, definitions throughout 
uh, history, you know, not even that long ago, like maybe a hundred mm. years ago to now. And originally it was a, a, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially the idea that you were uh, providing tools, a set of a, uh, a skill set in order for people to develop critical thinking skills and uh, to to develop and hone their own talents and their gifts. But you were giving them the foundational tools with which to do so. And then it became this uh, definition of, I believe, in the 1930s, where uh, it shifted to a definition about neuro neurological activity, which I think was really trying to... And I, you know, chronologically, it kind of makes sense. I think it was trying to pave the way for some of this transhuman uh, type of narrative and agenda. Uh, I think it was a little bit of a, you know, maybe not militaristically, but, you know, pr operational preparation of the environment um, because mm. uh, that, that's right around the time when the technocracy Inc. was around and when, uh, you know, they infiltrated at Columbia University. So mm. I do think it was trying to make, and it's also this very, uh, you know, behavioralist idea that we are just a, a blank slate or a sequence of experiences. And uh, so education is just giving us those uh, stimuli in yeah. order to respond and react to, but yeah. you know, that wasn't what education was. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, those are three <laughs> wonderful questions. Um, yeah. As, as an addendum to, to that, I'll just add, the one of the the biggest problems that I think our society confronts is nominalism. Mm -hmm. the tendency to try to find the meaning of things ontologically from the word, the label that's associated with a definition that is yes. already pre very fixed and rigid. Hence, this is the Aristotelian way, right? Yep. Also upgraded by Descartes. Descartes did this a lot. Everything is in categories, and the cat everything you see can then fit into one of the pre existing categories. It's it's computer thinking, basically. It's computer thinking. Yeah, and um, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I, I'll yeah. add to this. Did uh, Descartes looks like he had some occult handlers? Do Do we yes. agree with that? I have seen I've seen evidence to the, that substantiates what you said. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we'll add um, that to the list. <laughs> which is which is part of the thing. If you want to create an occultist, a superstitious mystic, create a reductionist. If you if you can if you can do that, you'll 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 get a you'll very easily be able to generate a mystic uh, very quickly. Um, right. it, it, so if you think that the mind is just is just the senses and is just like reducing things down to pre-configured like rules that you can't know anything about, yep. then it won't take long for a mind to realize that there's a big chunk of activity that doesn't fit that uh the only models or the only moldings that i'm told i have to fit every everything possible into and so all of a sudden all of these nonlinear things that don't fit right they they exist because i still experience them inside myself inside my feelings and so you know the ghost in the shell right in inside of the the universe i could see evidence of like order like the golden section that shouldn't exist according to the models that i was told i have to like fit everything into and the techniques of of deductive or inductive reasoning that I was told I have to fit everything into. Um, so how do I explain that? Well, then all of a sudden supernatural forces can become a very satisfying thing to then embrace. And then you're into like a whole new geometry of, of decline at that point. Like any, a lot becomes possible as far as where your new orbit is going to be flowing for the rest of, unless you can make a, a humbling discuss like discovery that you were, your, your predicates were wrong to begin with. And then right. if you can have that that experience through a shock, a trauma, or maybe something kinder uh, that maybe would, you know, <laughs> a, a more loving platonic dialogue, whatever, if you can discover right. that humility, you can like sort of retrace your steps, figure out where you went wrong in the, on the on the dark path and get back right. on something uh, that's more more uh, sustainable. All that to say, okay, so nominalism is, is, is rough and people always should be looking for context because the word itself never tells you what the thing is. Yeah. It's always the context that tells you what the, what the word is. Um, right. so context, uh, what's outside the frame, right? Um, what's between the notes, what's between the words. So that's why the Chinese language, I find it fascinating because it's all based upon context. Like the symbol can mean like so many different things based yeah. upon the context that it's located. And so the mind, it's just, it's, it's not that it's like the eight, the Chinese mind is different. It's just that there's a, there, it's not like not, not compatible because humans who are platonic do that anyway. Sure. But it's, it's like it's more formalized in that sense to always look for, well, what is the contextual situation that shapes the meaning of that symbol within that con anyway. So okay, I think Japanese is too. I'll, I'll just add that. I think Japanese yeah. is more like that too. And language again, does shape so much of how we think 
Uh, I think that's why they manipulate language. And as you pointed out, anomalism is one of the ways they do that. So you have a nice little bow and then it's that that packaging. And again, it's, it becomes this is reductionistic uh, ex example uh, or explanation, but it becomes marketing. It's like, oh, I like that pretty yeah. package. So, yeah. Yeah, it becomes the art of persuasion. Whoever could then like control whoever has the influence and the power to make their particular definition become the dominant one controls the definition. It doesn't mean that they're right or wrong. They may they may not even believe in the truth, but because they believe in the power to impose their will and their, yeah. their desired definitions of the word that will be used, that's sufficient to say what truth means, which is why you go to Wikipedia today and there's like whatever, 13 different definitions of different theories of truth. And it's like, wait a minute, how could, if it's true, it's true. If it like, anyway. Yes. yes. <laughs> I love what you said. Yeah, great coverage. So you, you brought three points. One, uh, humanism, two, philosopher yeah. king, three, Lucidian cults, and the, yeah. the other mysteries. So the for the first one... And then the, Dick, the Descartesian cult. Yeah. That was oh, the yeah. Fourth. Yeah. Right. We can get to that later, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so <laughs> the, the, the first one, yeah, again, Renaissance. Uh, sorry, humanism. So what is what is... The word humanism, as as you read in the uh, the secrets known only to the inner release paper, is is shaped by a different set of 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 concepts than the type that we would typically see from like a Bertrand Russell or a transhumanist who also talks about the word. They use the word, but the word is a scary thing because they're talking about like like you said, it's 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 a it's it's a religion of of human devoid of any moral or causal principles like the creator of the soul or metaphysical principles that would otherwise bound right. the human in, in some way. So it's like a religion of empiricism that sort of generated the perversion. The worst elements of the enlightenment was like, yeah. that. it was like, okay, the enlightenment proves that we can now use logic tied with sense perception to prove that there's no necessity to rely upon a, a, a god as a first cause to explain anything. Ultimately, there's ultimately mechanisms, cold, dead mechanisms that can describe things. And because yeah. we can know these things, we are the co we're, we're the the species that is without cause in that sense. So it's it's it actually became a a a, a mode of thinking to justify enslaving most of humanity by an elite alpha class who would have that power to impose their will onto the masses. Hence the Bertrand Russells, the Fabian society people, like it became just an excuse to, to dupe people into walking into a cage. Um, so it's very anti-human. It's yeah. Yeah, that humanism is an anti-human humanism. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> the, the healthier thing that we would see would be what I would consider like a Renaissance humanism. That would have been mm -hmm. nicer if, if maybe LaRouche had, had used that word Renaissance yeah. humanism. Because it does frame it a little bit more succinct or it differentiates it a bit. From, because what was the Renaissance? Well, the Renaissance also had bad stuff. It had perverse sure. neoplatonists, right? Uh, yeah. Doing super decadently bad things. Totally. It also had like wonderful humans as well sure. doing, uh, acting upon the concept of the idea that mankind is made in the living image of a living, reasonable, loving creator. And that right. concept is there in the, 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 you know, um, the Nicene Creed. It was mm -hmm. part of what was, that concept was what was, what allowed for the early Christian church to do battle with the Gnostic heresies, the, the Valentinians, the Marcians, the, the, the Manichaeans, the various other, you know, Gnostic mystery schools that were essentially, um, because there were mystery schools and there's a lot of evidence that I've encountered that demonstrate that they were actually controlled by the cult of Isis, the cult of Mithra, the cult of Sibel. They were just like infiltrating Christianity from within, taking yep. the cosmology already of the, already existent within yep. the, the architecture of the Mithraic and the, the Isis and Osiris mystery schools and infusing it into a pseudo-Christian veneer, adopting also some hermetic uh, writings. Um some 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 Zoroastrian writings, some some Kabbalistic writings, and sort of creating a Chaldean hodgepodge that would groom that would basically uh, revive paganism under a Christian veneer and yeah. and restore the proper control of pagan mystery schools once again. But that had to there was a big war, a massive war for the first couple of centuries of Christianity that people don't appreciate. So when you read the Nicene Creed, there might be things you might disagree with when people are sure. like looking at the, the corrupt p people who played a role in the Council of Nicaea and 
like Constantine was obviously not a true Christian. He was obviously a, a member of the murdered, like most of his family. And then yeah, he like, started because he was like, oh, if I baptize, I'm going to be like redeemed. <laughs> and yeah. No. Yeah, clearly. And he, and he made sure that all of these like Mithraic, you know, Mithraeum were all located under the, the new churches that he sanctioned. So there was like a clear yeah. um, fakery there. But there was there were thousands of people representing all sides who were fighting it out and duking it out. And so by, by the victory of the Nicene Creed was super important mm-hmm. of, a, of, a, of a the enshrining as unnegotiable the idea of a living, reasonable creator God that is one God that created the, us in his image. Like, that's super important. Um, yeah. and, it, and it created a, a framework around which you could, like, do proper battle with a lot of these mystery religions. So um, the Renaissance humanist idea that those who participated in that aspect of liberating mankind from empire by creating situations like um, beauty and science, the, the explosions of new discoveries in all domains, uh, both in the, like I said, the artistic domain, architecture, engineering, look at Da Vinci, right? They call him, a, I mean, it, it, he's almost been turned into a cartoon figure, but when yeah, you actually look at him as- Rosicrucians claim him as their like progenitor now. Well, that's what they do, right? So the Rosicrucians, if you can't, if you can't destroy them, you try to like co op them and make them your own and redefine what they are. So they, they did that with Kepler. They did that with Leibniz. They did that with everybody who threatens them as they say, okay, if we would have preferred that they'd never existed right. or Benjamin Franklin, right? He's a, he's a hellfire club, uh, pedophile, obviously that's right. what he, he's drinking baby blood. So they, if you can't destroy them, you're like, well, at the very least, what we can do is co-opt them and repackage what people think they are in, in our controlled way. And we'll create new myths around using like horror academics that we will publish heavily and create a new consensus in the next generation around what those individuals actually were. And we'll disencourage people. We'll either destroy their original writings or we'll disencourage people from the habit of reading original writing so they won't be able to differentiate reality from what the, the expert says is the thing. So all that to say, uh, the, the explosion of beauty. Now the thing with, and also it, it accompanied the explosion of political freedoms, the, the creation of the first city, uh, nation states, yeah. accompanied the activation of the, the these platonic ideas and the challenge of creating a republic around Louis XI in the 1480s to early 1500s, Henry VII, who was also another, had wonderful advisors um, like Cardinal Morton, who was the teacher of, of Thomas More and the guy who brought in the teaching of uh, the study of, of ancient Greece into Europe. He was working with similar like-minded people in, in Italy and in, uh, in a variety of other places. So that there was the idea that the king is not um, the ruler over the many as a master over the slave, but rather an, a servant of the people and an instrument of God's will on earth. So that right. concept was very different of what it means to be a leader or a king. And that was more in alignment with the philosopher king, which gets us at the second uh, question that you you asked. Right. So the idea of, um, so number one, the the idea of the the nation's treasuries being devoted instead of war making or what have you into building infrastructure um, as as the new idea of what value is, not what you can extract or steal or loot, but rather what you can create um, by by encouraging manufacturing, uh, textiles, the tr- the teaching of orphans how to how to read these things would create a higher power of generating greater value, not in the material alone sense, but in the standpoint of the, the power of the society to live longer, apply new discoveries and to ultimately, yeah, make more profit in the long run, but you got to be patient. Empires mm-hmm. hate it because now that's a society that's more smart, more self-aware, much more inc- less inclined to be enslaved, much more inclined to want to die for a cause because they can like read philosophical ideas that they wouldn't if they were peasants who are serfs illiterate. So that's something that the oligarchy wants to always like, like make sure that that doesn't tend to get out of control. Um, but so that's the sort of thing that also threatened Venice. So it was, you know, look at Henry the seventh, he'd organized with, with Henry, with Cardinal Morton and Moore and, and Machiavelli who all again, really cool guy, Machiavelli, really cool guy. So Thomas yeah. Moore and Machiavelli were both kind of, uh, misinterpreted or weaponized. I would. Yeah. Super weaponized, but you would only know that because people are given again, a very out of context sliver of something in the utopia right. and 
something giant is extracted to say, oh, look, that inspired Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. Right? It, it, same thing, right? He's, he's a Platonist, so he's obviously a tyrant, right? Same thing. And then they, they forget, well, but he also... He also was assassinated. Um, he was also, he wrote other things too. He was doing things throughout his life as like, in a, you know, the mayor of London. And he was like working really hard with networks around the world. Like, what well, those are, why don't we also look at what he was doing in the world? What, why don't we also look at what other things he was writing that would give us a better insight into, into whether or not that, that judgment we just made based on one out of context element of a text is right or wrong. Right. Same thing with Machiavelli, right? Like, look at what he was doing with Da Vinci. They were working closely together, defending Florence from the the Venetian armies that were, uh, well, basically mercenary forces that were being deployed in the battles of the League of Cambrai. And the League, I mean, this is you know, they were creating citizen soldiers together. They were in Da Vinci was innovating, um, like weapons. Absolutely, he was doing that. But mm -hmm. he was doing that not in order to dominate the world, but rather to like defend the city-state structure that had created such a massive explosion of creative discoveries amongst their population in the Renaissance that saw a massive spike in quantity of people that could sustain. Like That's why all of these eco-freaks today, they, they, they all hate the fact that something happened at the Renaissance, which where you see like the population growth patterns of, of human history. And all right. of a sudden something happened at the Renaissance where all of a sudden we like spike exponentially. And they uh -huh. hate that. They're like, that's why we're a, a parasite because only par or a virus or whatever that or a cancer on on Mother Gaia because only cancers grow at that type of exponential growth rate. <laughs> and what they hate is the fact that we had something that was a moral fight that involved the organized organizing real philosopher kings, which is like people who saw themselves um, as capable, like who were in positions of political influence and who had a moral conscience that was developed around an idea of being willing to die valuing the health of your soul instead of the the benefits of your body that's like a real philosopher like a real lover of wisdom so i think okay the second thing the not, i'll just add to that you know because it, i think it's been co-opted by the the theosophical cults where the lover of wisdom i mean theosophy me, literally means divine wisdom but they think that through theurgy divine work that they're going to become gods this is the the opposite of that it's the Ooh. love of wisdom right Mm. I, I that's how I interpret it. It's the opposite well, of that. the love of wisdom as having been, you know, something that w we're endowed with the ability to achieve, not that we then through achieving it become gods, Ooh. but that God has given us the ability to achieve that. I think it's completely <laughs> no, that's beautiful. That's a beautiful, beautiful idea. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, the, the philosophy literally means the love of wisdom, the, the theosophists profess to have that wisdom that's 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 actually sophistry that's not the same thing yeah, like the soph sophia just means wisdom right yeah the holder of it and it's like no it's if you truly love it it means you're willing to die for the truth it, it, because and you're you constantly it. seeking it you don't claim to have it what did socrates say yeah. he who knows knows he knows nothing i mean yeah. i i find through all this research that i do i'm constantly just like bewildered by how much everything I thought I knew seems not to necessarily be true and how yeah. much I had no clue even was in existence. Yeah. Yeah, me too. yeah it's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> but so, yeah, I mean that, and that's, so that's the thing you got, you got the Renaissance humanists and the philosopher Kings are, are pretty much the, moving on the, the beat to the same frequency. It's, it's, it's two interconnected right. ideas. Right. Um, the, the philosopher's stone idea. Yeah. Like you said, the, the whole hermetic obsession with, with, uh, the, the elixir of life, life and eternal life and cheating death. That's part of like, I think a deep human, uh, psychological infantilism that is kind of like addicted to sensual experience and not able to to deal with the reality of mortality, you know, like there's, that's a fact that, that my cat doesn't really deal with existentially. Um, animals don't have that issue. Whereas humans can contemplate through our, our powers of reason and imagination and conscience, uh, states far removed from our current existence yeah. in time and in space. And so the, it, it doesn't take long before a, a kid starts thinking about what, you know, death, and a, a mature human is supposed to have been able to process that in a loving way. Think about deeper, you know, the deeper nature of the soul, the deeper purpose of, of being a human. You know, these are like normal things that a mature mind, hopefully by the, you know, the early teens has processed and has come to terms with in a happy way. 
so that it, you know, I mean, that was the whole quest of the pre-Socratics. I mean, they were all like contemplating the existence of humanity and searching for primordial transcendence, and that's essentially. The, I mean, well, they all went about it in different ways, but you know. Well, but then, and this is where this leads into the third element too of yeah. the Eleusinian cults and the mystery cults, yeah. because they were also pursuing immortality. You know, it's the immortality key, as as Muir Rescue calls it in his trashy Jesuit inspired book. Uh, it's like, oh, I was given pure access to the catacombs under the Vatican. Oh, well, thank you, thank you, Jesuits. It's like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> oh, by the way, Jesus was an alien or on psychedelic drugs talking to aliens. Um, so. <laughs> Part of the, the, the whole thing is um, the Eleusinian mystery cults are an aspect of something that seems to have been a, an integral component for the maintenance of the, the broader empire systems of controls. Um, Eleusis is a place near Athens. And uh, and it I don't know what date it was set up. I don't know if anybody knows what date it was set up, but it seems to have been a branch of the Delphic Oracle system. And... Um, the Delphic Oracle, the Pythian Oracle, as they sometimes call it, was was located at Delphi. It's, it's pretty close to Eleusis, Eleusi, uh, and that was a, I guess that was a, a you know, an or it was, it was a Sibyl. They call them Sibyls, S Y B I L. Okay. Um, these basically these these young mystic maidens, sacred sacred maidens who are typically given opiates or other hallucinogenic narcotics, and uh, and are abused. Quite a bit, it seems. Kind of like the, you know, if you look at the 1890s, early 19th century uh, channelers. Oh, there's a crazy image of one right there. Yeah. Um, that was a big thing. The spiritualist movement that was promoted by the Theosophists and Blavatsky in the in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, uh, all the way till, you know, you know, it was big in the early 19th century before it all created the UFO cult after World War II of channelers getting messages from the beyond, right? And it, having that interpreted by uh, initiated priests. Um, so that was the the Delphian girl was was generally blubbering random things she was getting while she was while she was high symbolic ramblings whatever else um, and uh, and and the the priests would then interpret who weren't busy raping her on the off time you know but they were uh, they were then <laughs> interpreting that for those who would pay money a lot of money to get a message from the gods from Apollo in the Delphi the, the Delphi oracle's case or another god. Um, and, and then they would go and be told, okay, the God wants you to go declare war against Sparta or go have this alliance with uh, Persia. You know, that's what you should do. And everybody did that. Everybody had to go there and pay fealty and money. And they, they became the sort of center of global banking, early banking, because everybody was paying so much money. They, they, they basically controlled massive trust funds that were then sent out to give loans on usury or on conditions that the loans would be done on the condition that you make sure that this person dies or whatever, you know? So it became like a very useful control center and they had their embassies, their, their, their cultish envoys in, in different courts of the, of the, the known Mediterranean world and, and Egyptian and, and, and Persian world. Um, and so all integrated. Sorry huh? to interrupt, but I, I think that's where uh, LaRouche talks about uh, the co-option of like creating the false Judaism and that that was part of like creating this uh, yeah. the control grid. I, I'd have to find the exact quotes, but he does talk about that. I mean, there's no doubt that there has been mystification of uh, Judaism throughout history. Um, certainly we see that with the Kabbalah and we see that e even the Kabbalah itself, I think has been re repeatedly mystified. The Lurianic Kabbalah, I think was one of the biggest, that's where that whole like, uh, Tika Olam comes into play and they, they kind of switch the meaning of it. It, it had originally meant like that after uh, you do away with any kind of like, a you know, plural idolatry, um, that you would have this, uh, you know, that basically, like, you would have this, uh, I, I don't remember how they worded it, but, you know, that that would be when you would have, uh, you know, the, the the goodness would come, you know, it would be. Um, but then it, it shifted to mean, like, this uh, kind of good for the collective and essentially mm -hmm. social justice. And a lot of these, like, today, modern times, liberal, uh, you know, Jewish groups who are, I think, more reform have really run with that. Um 
I, I'm not, I, I don't remember the exact wording, so I'm not being particularly articulate, mm. but I do remember that from the Lurianic. Well, uh, yeah, I, without, because that's, that's, that's a, something we could dive into. Um, okay. I've, I've, I'm not an expert on this as well. I, I'm just trying to make sense of it just as, as you are as well. And yeah, you know, I've, I, I, I know what's I, for <laughs> <laughs> what seems to be the case is that, yeah, there's something about the Kabbalah, which was generated, it seems, during the 70 years in captivity in Babylon. Yeah. Um, and there were certain, like, you, you could recognize the cipher numerological language and general philosophy of, of this secret doctrine. Um, as far as like a way of interpreting certain sacred scriptures according to sure. not what the word or the sentence is saying, but rather the a hyper reductionist idea of like just combine all the symbols mm -hmm. into like one giant text, and then you can use sort of ciphers to like pattern the text in certain ways and look at every like third number, second number, treat them all as sounds, not even as words that are being said or being sent like that you could think about. So it's yeah. like reduces things to an unintelligible blubber and then only a priesthood that of initiates will tell you what their particular cipher that they're utilizing will yeah. allow you to uh, inter interpret what you're experiencing with a few other techniques of, of self-induced hypnotic, you know, trances and stuff that are part of the prayer aspect of, of, of it. Um, yeah. But it's a very useful tool of just deconstructing people's minds and then reconstructing it according to a a what you'd identify as a Rosicrucian or a Hermetic Order of Golden Dawn type of uh, yeah. approach to knowledge, hyper reductionist, yeah. hyper numerological, highly. In French, we say like n'importe quoi, like whatever you know, like uh, there's no there's no standard of of truth. Um, right. Except what the priesthood interprets. So all that to say, there's something to do with the the, the that period in captivity. Yeah. That was a lot of toxic poison into the story of like the secret doctrine that Moses got that he didn't write down and that had been passed down only orally to the special initiates. And then there's the variations of that in the Gnostic Christian world, you know, where the Gnostic scriptures, I forget if it's the book of Thomas or something, but right. are, within, are like, yeah, you know, Jesus told these things to the 12 disciples, but then, you know, to Mary Magdalene and to a couple of other, like really <laughs> right. he told a different story. And maybe you can know what that story is if you play your cards right. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I think the right. yeah, that, was a, that was a tangent, but yeah, and that would be a whole thing to dive into. Um, but it plays really into it, right? Because it's, it's yeah. sort of the, what we see with the Lucidian mystery cults and these various, all their Delphic oracles and the cult is that, so Eleusis was under the, 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 the goddess of Demeter, who's the harvest goddess. And the case that it, that's been made since Gordon Sassoon, um, who is the, the, the sort of guru of modern psychedelics with Albert Hoffman, they co-wrote a book together called the, on the road to Eleusis in the seventies. Albert Hoffman is the guy as a doctor who innovated like modern LSD 25. Um, that was then oh. deployed by the CIA and, and MK Ultra. Um, so that that's Hoffman. Now, Wasoon is the guy who was the biggest popularizer of uh, of psilocybins um, during his forays into Mexico in the fifties, and it was published was by Henry Luce. And the and the, the 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 Time Magazine made him like a, a big hero for the hippies and the beatniks, where everybody was doing pilgrimage to to go get high on a ayahuasca and psilocybins. And so, but they that's became being the revived today. <laughs> revive today yeah so they became the sort of modern experts on elusis why because i think they were already studying elusis like i think hoffman was looking at the Eleusinian mysteries as far as like how the the concoctions that would be put into the beverage that would give people a hallucinogenic trip in the ancient times was derived from um a wheat wheat fungus or not uh yeah wheat fungus like a wheat blight that when, there's, there's documentation throughout recorded history in different parts of the world that that various types of wheat crops when they get a certain type of air, this fungus is called ergot uh, e-r-g-o-t when that happens um people go crazy <laughs> like it had there's case in the medi medieval period people start seeing oh. deep, like, monsters and things and it's a hallucinogenic and right. uh, it's been maintained generally for the elite as sort of a, a part of the secret elixir that that was part of the rituals of these mystery schools. And again, if you read like those popularizers of it, not just Wasson and 
by the way, Wasson um, was also the vice president of JP Morgan Bank. <laughs> Side note, right? <laughs> Funny how Whoa. these. Yeah. <laughs> Funny how these, these, these financiers who are supporting fascism all really care about drug liberation and freeing our minds. Like they really care about us so much. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, air gut poisoning symptoms, treatment history. Yeah. Right. Right there. Exactly. Um, diz dizziness called convolutions, psychosis. Yeah. A whole bunch of other things. Yeah. So um, on top of, you know, opiates like opiums and other things were other uh, also known and used to, to create an altered state in ancient times. And it seems like that's what the sort of concoctions that were being used to depattern and then repattern people who would be going through this. Now, the, the Eleusinian schools, everybody was kind of encouraged to do it heavily. Oh, are you still there, Courtney? I feel like I lost you. Oh, there you are. Okay. There you're, you're, yeah, blowing your nose. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Trying to be respectful to the audience, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, next time that I won't I won't ask questions. I know you're getting <laughs> okay, go uh, on. Yeah. So so um there were there were grades of initiation and everybody was expected to be in at least great in grade initiate one. Like that's sort of everybody. And it involves rituals that involved bacchanalian frenzies at usually for, for the evenings where everyone was encouraged to do sac sacred orgies. Um, help with narcotics and a lot of drum beating, repetitive drum beating. These were things that were discussed by a lot of these anthropologists in the 20th century. Um, that were this is literally what we saw in the counterculture revolution, right? The 60s. This is. Oh yeah, yeah. This well, this is what William Sargent from Tavistock is directly yeah. exploring with Battle of the Mind. He's he's looking at these different shamanistic and different you know rituals that are sort of carryovers from the ancient Eleusinian type of experience that every culture seems to have had elements of this sort of yeah. oligarchical perversion that yeah. organized themselves in certain similar ways, just like yeah. we have good, like common good things. I mentioned Confucius and Plato and, and Jesus <laughs> having tapped into very similar universal truths and acted accordingly sure. for the good. Similarly for evil, you have certain common expressions of the perversion of that in different cultures in Africa and South America. And the how did the Aztecs become like how did they decline from being this high civilization of Olmecs earlier, way earlier? You know, like there's certain things that, that are universal attributes that are, that touch on this. Um, right. So we're seeing sort of the echoes of failed civilizations in some cases uh, when we're looking at modern, sh like, you know, tribal ritualistic cultures that hippies want to like go and spend money and get that experience, you know, but that's what was being popularized by these creeps. Now, so in, in the Eleusinian mysteries, every, Everybody's doing these bacchanalian rituals. Slaves are encouraged to join as well as higher members, but the slaves aren't going to go to the second or third higher levels, you know? Yeah. Within that, now Demeter um, is also known, she's got several names in different parts of the world. She's also known as Sibel. That's another name for Demeter. Sibel okay. has not a part of Attis, so that's the cult of Sibel Attis that you'll usually find. In, in, in Egypt, it's it's Isis, who's the right. Egyptian variant of the of Demeter, Sibel. Um right. In the, and you'll usually find in the case of Rome, after Sibel was brought in in the Second Punic War, around 190 or so, was brought in as a mystery cult from Anatolia into the as, as part of the, the prophecy of one of the, the oracles who were managing the, the books of Apollo um, that was sort of advising the Senate of what to do. How do you how do you defeat Hannibal? Well, they, they said you just bring in sanction the the Sibel cult to make it its its official entry uh and give it license to operate in rome and you'll win against hannibal and uh, that was done by uh, a lot of that negotiation was actually done by emperor fabius maximus who is later on his name was taken up by the fabian society right um as sort of the the left hand path of the right hand path of the round table so like or you got this whole like uh masculine penetrating power in the, this alchemical you know management of society and then you got the feminine wrapping power of the of so Sibel has the high priestess a lot of orgies a lot of drugs and then and 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 there's a right of initiation for the elects to to be processed through to become upper level management of the empire if they if they're one of the few who who like battles the shadow self and whatever goes into the abyss and comes out of it you know having defeated the the guardian of the abyss blah 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 but then like i was saying in rome the cult of mithra that was also brought in around the time when when Cicero was killed and Rome was becoming an empire around uh, Julius Caesar, it was actually Pompey that first brought it in to, through the Isle of Capri 
And that became the head, the base of operations for the cult of Mithra to become sanctioned. And, and you'll find that in, in archaeological research, the Sibyl Temple and the, the, the Mithraeum underground, which are always like sort of seen as like the womb of the of Mother Gaia. It's, it's part of the yep. ritual. They're always together. They're always attached. Um, you'll find. So it's they go hand in hand, except that the cult of Mithra was a male-only soul invectus cult. And Mithra was sort of a solar deity imported from Persia. Um Actually, it was before Persia. It was it, it? It ran through um, Phrygia. That's why there's the Phrygian cap. The same cap you see on the Doge of Venice is the Phrygian right. cap. So that's what Mithra is killing. He's killing the bull. And so that's for like the the warrior class. Still had mystery schools. Still had I think a lot of the similar rituals, but done for men only, and to create primarily or cater to a a, a warrior culture with the Roman legions all becoming initiates of the Mithraic cult. A lot of the emperors became uh, Mithraic uh, uh, elect members as well. Uh, Julian the Apostate was a big one who tried to like wipe out Christianity completely um, and restore paganism. So, you know, you they, they would work together. There, there would often be a lot of like androgyny, like in the cult of Sibel, if you wanted to be a hierophant, which is like a, a holy a holy person within the the hierarchy, you might raise to like the second or third level. Uh, or degree of initiation, but you'd also have to cut off your schlong and become like an androgynous human. And if you read the writings of, um, I, I suggest people read um, St. Irenaeus of Leon, um, who's this wonderful Platonist. Um, I was just reading his book this morning, uh, okay. Against Heresies with Fragments. Of, so his work against heresies is super good. And, okay. uh, and he's like calling out the uh, all of these these cults and how they were like, they had a cosmology of an evil creator God, a demiorgos that was actually a, an ignorant God that created the universe in his and image. Trapped evil. Huh? And trapped them, right? That, 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 yeah, that's and right. It's, it's shackle. And so life becomes this, this like, you, you can't really ever be happy in that type of cosmology. Mm. And, and, and be, since matter is evil and human matter is the most evil, mm. giving birth to babies becomes the most evil thing you could do. So cutting off your schlong is the most sacred good thing you can do and kill, you know, the, there's probably like exoteric and, and esoteric branches of the, the schools as well. You know, so people think that the highest that they, that they went was kill, like, you know, dousing themselves in, in, in bull's blood from a, from, from a, from a sacrificed bull. But then there's a whole other parallel network of initiation rituals that seem to indicate that you're also, killing humans, doing other things as part of your, if you're one of the special, special people, right? Same thing was done in the, in the Freemasonic, you know, uh, yeah. operations in more recent times. Yeah. So that's the thing. Like, this is the sort of thing that to get back to the question of the Illuminati. Yeah. I find that a lot of this is highly investigatable, but in a lot of the literature about the Illuminati, it's all sort of like brushed out. And instead Adam Weisthoff's grouping is given sort of like, almost godlike power over all bad things that have ever happened. And then this whole like spectrum of the mystery calls, the hellfire club, the, the whole structure uh, is kind of like, just, I never see too much of that going on. Or if I do, it's sort of like a subsection that doesn't matter so much within this right. new composition. So well, that, uh, that is interesting. I would agree with that. And I don't think that the Illuminati was like all powerful. And I mean, even today when they talk about the Illuminati, that's a, uh, you know, they, they 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 obviously the Illuminati was quote unquote shut down, so they're not really talking about the Illuminati, but they claim that it's infiltrated everything, and I don't really see it that way as the official has offic has infiltrated everything, but I see it as just an extension of the same shared worldview of these ancient mystery cults. Like to me, it's it's still this kind of worldview of essentially this Gnostic view that we were created by an evil demiurge and we were trapped and that it's through that man has the potential uh, of perfectibility. And that was what the Illuminati was originally called. It was called the perfectibilis, right? So I, I think it's more the, I, I do think that they were, uh, I do think they were a real group. I do think that they were very influential. And I think it's, you know, certainly they were infiltrating at the time of the French revolution, um, and I think that they're, uh, they were influential in promulgating certain uh, thinkers today uh, or who have, you know, lasting effects today. Um, I would say, you know, that some of the offshoots were very, you know, involved in 
promulgating people like Marx and Engels to power, um, you know, in, in, academically, ideologically. So I, I, I think that they're they're relevant, but I, I don't think that they're the, maybe it is a case of like, only look here, they control everything. And I don't see it that way. Maybe that's what you're picking up on. Or, oh, no, yeah. no, I mean, sorry, I'm just doing the cards. Yeah, I no, no, you're good. <laughs> it sometimes comes across in the microphone and it, it sounds rude. Sorry. <laughs> Um, um, no, I, what I, what I think is like when I reach like some of the high level evil players like Nesta Webster or, mm -hmm. uh, Winston Churchill, like I, I know that these people are directly part of the inner initiated cult high command. Yeah. Um, and then they'll sometimes talk about things that they want me to think about. And then it caused me to like pause and think, wait a minute, why do you want me to, why are you saying these right. things? That make me yeah. want. And we've all read the the you know the Churchill nineteen twenty uh, expose of Adam Weistop and the Illuminati, yeah. and right. um, and Nesta Webster as well. And her, uh, I mean, her husband was the chief superintendent of police of of British India, right, overseeing genocides. And like she, or like she's so enmeshed, trying to make the, yeah. uh, the the British elites out as the victims of the Jewish Masonic conspiracy of Kabbalists, and, and it's like there's a lot of truth in the conspiracy uh, analysis that's being provided in their works. But then it's like, what do, what are you, what are you trying to deflect me away from? Or what are you trying to like, and there that's, that's for me. Um, I, I I'm, agree with that. I'm re revisiting some of that, that stuff on that. Yeah. Um, I think that, that that's very valid. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know what it is that they're averting from. I thought it was really interesting. This was a point that LaRouche did bring up about the misinterpretation uh, from Karl Marx about uh, like that it was just the uh, idealist versus the um, the the pragmatist. He didn't word it as pragmatist. I forgot how, what the other word he, but that's essentially what he was saying. Um, and I just thought it, or the I, I, maybe the empiricist is what he was saying. Right. But I just think that it's kind of ironic because the uh, the anti-Marxists, the combatants of Marxism today, have kind of fallen into that dichotomy. Um. There's only right. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, point. wait, <laughs> you, you've literally point. fallen into the exact fallacy that Marx was propagating. <laughs> right. No, it's funny. I mean, well, the whole thing um, that I've noticed in trying to like investigate the weird psyop that Marx and Engels were um, is that it seems like, you know, the Delphic method, right? So the Delphic method. Yeah is uh has a lot is is tied to um the fact that delphi is the center of lies and global global evil and yet when you go there inscri inscribed on the the temple's entrance is know thyself to your own self be true uh there are like three very good common sense points of wisdom that everyone can agree on right and so right. it says these true things as statements but you come out of the experience uh, as as a as a hollow shell of a fool who's going to destroy yourself, who doesn't know yourself. Uh, so it's just it's an interesting irony. So the Delphic method is like take something true and and then infuse poison into it. Um, so uh, the thing with the battle in science that I had a as a, as a, a for those who may not know, listening, I was a volunteer with the Larouche organization from 2006 until 2017, um, and I went my own way. And during that time, there's a lot of high value experience that I had that I wouldn't have really have gotten anywhere else. So I, re I really cherish that. And among that, those experiences of the, that it were just the best, like I really had to sort of take myself out of my comfort zone. It was like a, a full-time sure. thing, um, was this curriculum that at the time was very vibrant early on for the first few years that um, LaRouche had, had emphasized the importance of studying original discoverers people who made discoveries, reading their writings and building a, a curriculum around um, creating a new leadership class that would be capable of formulating assessments and judgments of things that would be needed in the next generation. Because the older members of his, or his organization that had been created in the late sixties, that's when LaRouche sure. officially created his, his, his movement um, out of Columbia university. He was doing a, a non-credit uh, class, on uh, Marx's economics, actually, that was what he was originally teaching. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, <laughs> weird. 
But then you read the writings. Go, I, I read his first textbook on, on economics in 1971, and uh, it's called Dialectical Economics. And uh, it's fun because he's like taking elements of Marx, but then he's like breaking it and adding a lot of his own insights and discoveries into into physical economy that are that are just not even at all contained in Marx. Mm -hmm. So and then it took him another 10 years to even discover that there was this other um, Renaissance humanist constitutional system of finance that had been obscured from from our records in, in our history books. And that was only around that time, 1977, 78, that that he became aware that there was this other thing called the American system that uh, had a direct continuity to the works of, of Thomas More, uh, to Augustine, the city of God, to, to Plato and, and Cicero. And, and there was this direct continuity of, of application of an idea of a science of physical economy, which was also an art because it's based upon spontaneity, creativity, the free will of the individual. So that's, it's not your typical science because science is typically about predicting things in a, in a relatively mechanical way. Like the planets are not going to decide to do something different because they're, they're really shaped by the characteristic of being, I'm, this is Saturn, that's Jupiter. They will behave a certain way in right. orbit according to certain rules and they won't choose to wake up identifying as Mars or Venus, right? It's just planets are planets. So human beings have this additional factor, although we do have physical mechanisms of breathing, oxygen, food, right? If you, if you diminish the means of producing food based on a fallacious idea of what economic value is, you will create more scarcity, even though you think you're making money, but you're not because it's actually debt that's been securitized and gambled upon making money for a few, but you're destroying the base around which people are, you know, they live. You're, right. you're, you're not putting money into infrastructure, improving or maintaining. You're not putting money into R&D to overcome the limits to growth by making new discoveries. So you, all of these things can be rendered, um, the physical par parameters uh, could be made more constricted or better depending upon the moral and, and, and philosophical notions of what your political economy is. And that's what the American Revolution was all about. That's what Alexander Hamilton, uh, with, following a lot of the works of Benjamin Franklin earlier and a lot of other, other, other people like Jean-Baptiste Colbert that he was studying, was able to formulate in his, in his works on manufacturing and a national bank in the 1790s. This is what people added. They advanced th these concepts of, of you know, the productive powers of labor that have have to increase based upon the idea of the liberty of the individual and the well be the well-being of the whole at the same time, not one or the other. So there's this whole right. like movement. And you can get it if you read the writing of any of these people who like often died to defend and, and improve upon that situation all the way to Henry C. Carey, Matthew Carey, Henry Clay, um, these leading figures of the Whigs of, the, of, of America who were fighting against the oligarchy hellfire club takeover of the 19th century. There were all of the ones, McKinley also tapping into this protective tariffs, the idea of directed pr uh, productive credit. Yep. All it's this is what 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 Warren Harding was also tapping into with his reapplication of protectionism. This uh, the the uh, 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 Franklin Roosevelt was reviving this thing as well, having studied this and written a paper on this in the twenties um, regarding again increasing the productive powers of labor, utilizing the nation state to rein rein in the control of the banking, the private sector banking operations over the that of the sovereign nation. Um, there's this whole continuity that's investigatable. And I think in the 19th century, it was spreading around the world, especially after, you know, I mean, you know, you had you had American system economists advising the courts of Russia, building the first rail lines in the 1850s between St. Petersburg and Moscow, planning already the Trans-Siberian Railway that eventually had car like rail cars built from Philadelphia, Baldwin locomotives overseen by by Cassius Clay's, who's the ambassador, American ambassador to, to, to Russia overseeing the, the trains across the Siberian that were going to connect into China, into Japan, into... So all of this stuff was going... And it was all being funded by the idea of every nation could utilize protective tariffs, directed credit through national banks. Uh, the idea of British, like Adam Smith free trade was not necessarily um, seen as the only game in town anymore. So it was spreading globally. And I think if you can't beat it, try to co-opt it. And I think that that the role of Marx and Engels was partially, and I'm, I'm quite persuaded that that um, this this holds weight, was to create a Delphic uh, counterfeit, utilizing some of the outward appearance of what the American system was, while infusing Trojan horses um, into it. So the idea, like there are good things within Marx's writings on economics regarding his critique of empire of British, like John Stuart Mill, Ricardo, Malthus. He hates Malthus. And he's, he's making the argument 
though it's not a persuasive one in 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 the in Das Kapital, right. that human beings, human beings can always increase the productive powers of labor by overcoming limits to growth. He says that. Yeah. Now the actual That's understanding it. of how that works is not there in Marx. No. <laughs> The idea of like perpetual uh, class struggle is something that he just puts in there. There's no reason for that. Whereas when you read Henry C. Carey, whose works on a harmony of interests, I think that a lot of those elements that Henry C. Henry C. Carey is a leading advisor to Lincoln, and he's one of the key coordinators, kind of like a Ben Franklin figure, organizing international networks right. in Germany around Otto von Bismarck and the Meiji Restoration around E. P. Schein Smith around uh, the. Argentinian foreign minister in the 1860s and 70s is applying, is working with Henry C. Carey. He's got networks in Russia. Um, so he's like one of these kinds of grandiose figures. He's worked with Friedrich List, who also gets killed. They call it a suicide. Um, mm -hmm. List is, List's ideas were, were taken from Hamilton in America when he was here with Marquis Lafayette in the 1820s, studying for five years. Uh, Listomania. Yeah. List, what? Oh, Listomania. It, there, there's a song, Listomania, and I think it was based on uh, List. No shit, really? That's yeah. funny. I didn't no idea. So I, all I have to say, it was so powerful and it was threatening the structures of the of right. the oligarchy that they had to try to co-opt it, infuse their own poison into it, and right. then give people um, that instead of the actual thing, um, which is where I think the value of the Marx-Engels con constructions came in. Which was then like sort of played by Mazzini and you know Palmerston, who were like working the young Europe movements that were then being infused with this idea of weaponizing the mobs around what was done with the Jacobins earlier to disrupt the French Revolution. List domain. Oh, that's a different list. That's Is that's Franz List. Okay. That's Franz, that's Franz List, the the okay. sh the romantic pianist. Um, I was referencing okay. Friedrich List with an L I S T. Um, ah. German uh, American, he's the guy who coined the term American system in, and he was the founder of the Zolverein. So the idea of oh. unifying Germany in a, under a, a customs union. Right. Uh, Frederick List's uh, fight and he had to fight like hell to do that uh, based on the US model of how the, the early colonies were united together under a nation um, after, this, after the revolution. In order, so that was that was what created the modern, like Germany as a modern state instead of a divided thing, right? And it was driven by rail development, um, scientific academies, a lot of industrial, the idea that industry progress had to define the behavior of money. Um, that was all like really the list baby. And so well, you had this, again, idea of weaponizing the poor um, and giving more control to captured governments. And the governments would then take control of the, the functions of the state or over the, the will of the people or entrepreneurialism, which was not supposed to be allowed within a, a proper Marxist utopia. Right. And people should be allowed to own things and other, other crap like that. Um, and meanwhile, those governments would not be representative, but would be then captured governments by this hereditary power that would then just re-justify what's called social imperialism. So that became social imperialism. And that's where people like Lord Milner were giving classes on Marx's economics in Oxford in the 1880s or uh, Arnold Toynbee also oh, yeah. was giving classes on Marx's economics in the 1880s in Oxford because uh, it's like you can't beat it, join it. And then the weird thing is because there are – it's 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 kind of like Newton's formulas are, are taking the discoveries of Kepler and of Leibniz on the calculus and of Huygens on optics and it's repackaging them under a new sort of formula devoid of the substance. It still yeah. participates in a, a degree of truthful description – although it's full of toxic assumptions, yeah. but it will be applied by good scientists after Newton who as creative people will be able to take that formula that couldn't exist because of Newton. It exists because right. it was plagiarized by Kepler, but they will be able to apply, apply it at different times to make further discoveries. And they would, they make the mistake often of thinking, Oh, it's because Newton's a genius who had fruit fall on his head that that's why I made this discovery. He's such a great genius. And it's like, no, he had a whole grouping of Rosicrucian handlers, and he himself was a Kabbalist Rosicrucian. Um, didn't actually do real science in the Royal Academy, and he was the 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 you know the the chief of the mint of the Bank of England as part of the Venetian takeover. You're saying like that guy is like this great scientist who there's no actual evidence that he discovered anything, but he had handlers managing the image of him, kind of like Descartes did earlier. And they're all they're all these Kabbalist Rosicrucians who are all trying to say no, science is only for the, the 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 elect the right of priests right. who control the shadows cast on the cave wall 
for the people to believe that the shadows are the reality and not not the fire or the light. So that's only for the elite to know. And then they 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 wrap it in big big uh, uh, coverings of crazy. So the the real science is wrapped in crazy so that people don't actually know what causes science and it's only used but so all that to say that's what i think was was being done with the science of political economy before it could become a crystallized as sort of the unifying the unification of of arts science um and statecraft as a science of statecraft or, or right. as benjamin franklin called it a science of human happiness which is how he defined economics was a science of happiness right but right uh that, that requires not just giving everybody the right to have cake, but rather give everybody the dignity to understand wisdom and to love wisdom and to pursue it as your highest pleasure to be truly happy, to know that your kids are living a happier life. And that's the higher idea that um, that the Lockeans were not in agreement with. Right. So, you know, like I, I think that that's, that's the thing that we've been – that Marx was – Marxism was deployed to, to subvert. And it happened that occasionally in the 20th century, you'll find that there are people – who only knew Marx's economics in like Ghana or in South America or in various parts of the world who fought against empire. They were noble people. They sure. died in any case. They were assassinated by the CIA and like Kwame Nkrumah, right? He called himself a Marxist. He, he loved John F. Kennedy. They worked together, but he was extracting and taking what was useful within Marx that, that involved the critique of empire, the refutation of Malthus, the, the emphasis on improving the productive powers of labor um, there's certain scientific metrics that are useful. And then the shit that was distasteful, he just like left that out. It's it's pragmatism, right? You just take what's right. good, leave the bad. Sure. Um, whereas then you've got the other variations of the, the Marxists that are like, we see them taking over with the Frankfurt School that, that actually liked Malthus. They didn't want to increase the productive powers of labor. They actually liked empire, but they called themselves yeah. Marxists nonetheless. Yes. And, uh, and they're just everywhere, you know? They just get rid of you know, families and the idea of God and, and, and nation states and, and property. And all of a sudden we'll be this homogenous blob of happy, happy, drugged up people worshiping aliens or something. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. That does seem where they're trying to point us now. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you, so what, what evidence do you see for the occult handlers of Descartes? Cause I, I very much see that. And I feel like that's, it's relevant today. Cause I think we are being put into that, kind of Descartesian dualism now, which you, you would think that that question would have been. Let's reserve that one for a future one. Let me do a bit more work on it because it's something that I've only glanced over and no it's, it's, yeah. it smells like it. Yeah, um, that's how I feel too, but I don't have yeah. the enough. Yeah. So there's we'll actually a paper called Venice versus Leibniz um, okay. on the battle for a science of physical economy by um, an old friend of mine, an old colleague who would rather he asked to be made uh, uh, anonymous, so okay. I, but it's a great it's a great piece of research, and I cited it in the first part of my my occult Tesla series. Okay, occult oper operations around Newton, and within that essay, it's like a fifteen a uh, fifteen thousand word essay. It's really big and, and full of wonderful quotes of original players on the stage of history, good and bad alike. And uh, the the Descartes operation plays a prominent role within that story. Yeah. Um, and um, he he also makes a very good case that had it not been for Gottfried Leibniz's devastating attack and destruction of Descartes um, in the 1680s, 1670s even, that the Isaac Newton project would not have been necessary because Descartes was satisfactory as far as maintaining a... a, a a comprehensive system of, of looking at the world in a very specific kind of mechanistic way. Right. That was perfect and satisfying for the oligarchy. But again, Leibniz, who's the guy who went to war with the Newtonians, he went to war with the Lockeans on his new essays on human understanding. He wrote in platonic dialogues. Um, he, um, he discovered the cal the infinitesimal calculus by looking at physical curvature of catenaries, uh, hanging chains and bridges, and he was able to deduce what would be the principle that would cause this type of nonlinear curvature in physical reality, which may look like a parabola, but it's actually not a parabola. It's it's a different kind. It's a different species of curvature, which oh. requires an idea of harmonics, which he had gotten by studying Kepler's Harmonies of the World, a book that had been published like fifty years before uh, before his discovery. 
um, and in which Kepler discovering the, the musical arrangements of the planets around the sun and generates his three laws because of that proof that the Pythagorean platonic theory was true from 2000 years earlier from the Timaeus. Right. It took 2000 years to finally get the data to actually prove that that hypothesis was actually true, which Kepler devoted his life to. And then he challenged future mathematicians saying the, the only thing I couldn't solve is a language that would describe non nonlinear changes because he discovered that the planets were also ellipses. And so he put that challenge out there and, and Leibniz took up the challenge. And that's where it gets weird because today Newton is credited for discovering the calculus along right. with Leibniz, to give him co-credit. Right. So it's, it's it's such an interesting battle within science to see how like these these discoveries were made and how the oligarchy always reacts to try to like do the same thing to co-opt and uh, <laughs> and repackage discoveries in their own choice chosen way and and it's usually done by it's always done by occultists who um, yeah. would rather the discovery simply be um, based upon um, they, they they like the they like the effects like uh, you know the old if you look at how the oligarchy lived in the middle ages in the 13th century or 12th century or even a little after that yeah they were like eating rotten food. They were not using flushing water. They, you know, right. they, they didn't have soap. They had rotten teeth as well. You know, like the toothbrush, tooth care uh, technologies were limited. They were bloodletting, you know, uh, when they got colds, you know, tons of uh, infections. So the oligarchy, even within the inner echelons of power within the oligarchy, I've seen no evidence that they, that they want to have the philosopher's stone that they pretend that they do. <laughs> right. Uh, they all die. <laughs> um, some of them have <laughs> right. better access to, to medical tech and, and get baby organs or injections of, of fresh, you know, child's blood and stuff. That That's horrifying. Probably truly done. But that still doesn't result in Kissinger living forever. He still, like, died a miserable old sick guy at 100, you know. Um, and before that, they were living, like, shit lives as well in the Middle Ages. And so the discoveries that, they, that were made that they currently enjoy having heating in the house and air conditioning and running water – they like using it, but they hate the thing that allows that to happen. It's the weird self-contradiction of the of the empire itself as a as a system in the universe. It's like they want to be gods, so they, they they don't want to attribute it to being you know human ingenuity and to you know a a, a mortal huh. being. They 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 want to be the gods and they want to use it for controls and lever of power. Yeah. So. Well, look at the, the black sun shit, right? Like the, the reason why that that's such a, a big fetish for so many for so many of these occultists is yeah. that that was one of the the early I think big big techniques that were probably co opted and stolen by innovative transoceanic maritime civilizations that are probably prehistoric. But when you're when you're when you're sailing across the oceans. You, you're relying on the stars. You have to have deep knowledge of the stars or you'll be lost. And so sure. there are certain discoveries of cycles. There's certain discoveries of, of celestial phenomena that will, that will happen if you're solving that problem. Yeah. Um, and amongst those, the, the recurrence of the, the ability to foresee when uh, eclipses will happen becomes something that is very useful. Sure. And a priesthood loves having that knowledge and convincing the superstitious dumbed down masses that look, they know the gods because here's my proof in, in three months, you're going to see the, the sun blocked out. And that means that you should have been listening to what I've been telling your Kings to do. And so it happens. And then all of a sudden they become the gods, you right. know, and, and, and they love shit like that. Or, or the, the idea of, if you look at the, the British society for psychical research in yeah. the, uh, the 1880s and, and 1890s, they're, they're taking scientific discoveries of ma being made by great people and yeah. co-opting them and saying, oh, look, the, the Crookes tube, the cathode ray tube, it's great for seances. It's great for emanating a mystical vibe or to create, you know, an electric shock that will convince you that your loved one is speaking to you from the grave using, <laughs> you know, little electric nodes under my table uh, and shit like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, this, yeah. <laughs> um well, I think my, my, my last question for you would be about, because we, we had talked a little bit, we touched on it, but we didn't flesh it out, was uh, how the, it looks kind of like we've got the neo neoplatonists as kind of the uh, one, you know, right-hand arm of the left, however, or maybe it's the reverse of the Aristotelian. Um, and I, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Like, how are the, how do they come into play and how did they, uh, 
they claim to be Platonists, right? But you know, I from what I know, it doesn't seem like they're really aligned with Plato. It seems like they've kind of co-opted and weaponized Plato. And they seem more aligned with the ancient mystery cults in some cases. So Yeah. Well, I think that um when you read the writings of people like Neoplatonist Hermeticist, like um how was his name? Ficino, um, mm. who ran sort of the, the Platonic Academy in Florence, uh mm. in the, the 16th century. Um, he's a really disturbing character because he like, you know, he acts like he loves Plato and he produces all of these Neoplatonists and they go on to advise governments and shit. But you, it, he's, you read his writings and they're, they're, they're so disgustingly opposed to everything Plato stands for. Like, you know, he hates the idea. He thinks of the body as a hellish trap. He thinks, you know, yep. he's a clearly a Gnostic. He, he yep. Plato doesn't believe that. He believes that human beings are, are ultimately, he believes that the Promethean concept of humans is ultimately, um, must be destroyed. Yeah. Now, that being said, the Promethean concept as well has gotten a very bad rap as yep. well by the Luciferians because yep. they're like, oh, look, Prometheus was Lucifer because Prometheus disobeyed Zeus's edict and, and Prometheus stole fire and he shouldn't have. And so... Zeus is like God and, and Lucifer is like the rebellion against God. And that's, that's for me. And it's like, wait a minute. If you actually read Aeschylus's Prometheus un, uh, bound, right. the story, I mean, it's a beautiful story. Everyone should read this story. It, it takes like an hour and a half to read it. It's wonderful. And it's like such a loving story of, of Prometheus who saw the potential of the goodness and beauty of human beings that were being kept in the mud and living in caves, not allowed to know the knowledge of fire by the rule of Zeus, who said only the gods are allowed, to, the immortals are allowed to know how fire works. Yeah. And uh, and he felt that love of humanity. And he describes it. Aeschylus's character has um, the, the, the discussion of the love of the potential, the love of humankind that animated him, even though he knew he was going to likely suffer uh, torture for 10,000 years having right. a, a vulture pick at his liver every day for 10,000 years while he's chained to a rock, you know, like that's big. So, and then with fire, it's also understood that it's also a metaphor for math, the arts, animal husbandry, science, chemistry, all this stuff. Um, so that, that in the Protagoras dialogue is where Plato actually identifies that he's like, look, I am a pro, I am a Promethean. That is what I am. And he describes it in detail. And then there's another die. I think it's the Critias. He, he also says the same thing. Um, all of the the true Platonists are Promethean because you just you have a disdain for un, injustice and uh, master slave structures of control, and you have the love for wisdom and sharing with with those who are in the cave. That's the other thing with Plato is that within the Republic book, I think it's book seven in the the cave allegory, the oligarchy just like Milton, how they despise how Milton talks about paradise found. They hate the fact that Plato in the in the cave allegory that has the the one person happened to get out of the cave and start yeah. adjusting to the light of the sun. They like that part of like how the elite knows a higher reality and can use to control the many who like have to believe in the shadows. Yep. That's they the part like you hear that. about all the time. Yeah. But the part of that story that Plato writes about that they despise and you see that they never want to talk about is where Plato says to be, but the true philosopher will be, uh, will go back into the cave yep. to help his fellow Humans get out of the cave, even at cost of his life, because he's going to say that the reality is false. And that means people will want to possibly hurt or kill him. And he he's impelled to do it anyway. This is the story of Socrates, right? This is the trial of Socrates. The story of Socrates, right? It's this <laughs> yeah. freaking thing. And <laughs> so it's like you can see how they're able to do the sleight of hand all the time. And um, yeah, as far as the, wait a minute, um, I lost my train of thought. The Neoplatonists. Okay. Right. So Ficino, yeah, same thing. He, Ficino says that uh, that the that the Promethean idea is must be destroyed. Um, he believes in the reality as a shackle, as an enslavement. You know, right? That you have to only overcome. And he's he's the, he's translating all of the anti-Platonists. He's translating the Hermeticists. He's all of the mystics um, that are talking about things they obviously don't understand. Yeah. Um, they're all the numerologists. So again. Not a real Platonist. And um, and as far as, like, I think, I, I suspect that Aristotle was probably also an occultist. Um, I've, I've heard people give me persuasive uh, lectures that I've heard on YouTube 
sure. that like, people who are who love the occult, who are really adepts at it, giving right. expositions about the occult Aristotle that maybe the surface Aristotle is just like the, the, the Descartes surface or the, the Newton surface uh, projection for the mass consumption or the Darwinian mass consumption for the masses. But there's right. that inner uh, teaching or variation of the transhumanist eugenics for the elites who will be the new master race selectively breeding out the unfit which is part of like the the extra bit of the the extra bit of the joke that most people are not allowed to acquire. So they're <laughs> right. much similar as far as the the unmoved mover of the Aristotelian cosmology and these other things that he might have actually have been a Neoplatonist. Uh, either way, he was definitely an infiltrator who was infiltrating Plato's, Plato's academy. It seems like he was tied to Isocrates, who is a uh, the, the founder of the Peripatetic school who is like a leading oligarchist trying to, who is basically creating, generating uh, sophists from yeah. his, his machine of, of, of his anti-Platonic academy. Creating a school of sophists. Yeah. Huh? Creating a school of sophists. Yeah, exactly. And that was what was going to war with Plato, who was exposing the sophists. And, uh, and he was working for the Persians. And it seems like there was something known as the Isocrates plan that was supposed to be done by Philip of Macedon to break off to create a Western Persian empire that would then come to dominate all of Greece and Italy and everything else. And like, you know, North Africa that, that later became the Roman empire. And that so that, that Isocrates plan that Isocrates was, was co-organizing with his students, including Aristotle, which Aristotle was fired by, by Alexander the great for a reason, right? Alexander the great said that you're brainwashing me and fired Aristotle, who was assigned by his father to be his tutor. And he said, no. And instead he had, um, people like uh, Susipus, a, a student of Plato, who was teaching him instead. And so we had these Platonic advisors from the Platonic Academy who organized a different strategy to overthrow Philip and then to overthrow the entire Persian Empire and establish um, a, a totally different kind of culture that didn't last long. I mean, in terms of the empire didn't last long, but the culture continued to endure all the way to India, right, where we have these Hellenistic like golden section structures in Gandhara in like today's Afghanistan and India that have just recently been discovered that it's like the Eastern part of Bactria, um, that we're all Hellen Hellenistic um, um, components of the Alexandrian empire. And he was murdered possibly by Aristotle's nephew, who was also making his food. That's what um, LaRouche said. That's yeah. what LaRouche said, yeah. And, and, and it seems like that's there's something to back that up. Um, so all that to say, there's this, this whole thing of the the um, these these uh, Aristotle and the Neoplatonists seem to be two sides of the same thing. Yeah, um, that's what it looked like to me. Yeah, like yeah, they seem to work together, point. and and it seems to also be kind of like the there. There's a fellow who did a really good. I cited him in in one of my recent reports um, on Rudolf Steiner and and Aleister Crowley. Yeah, and, that was great. Oh, you saw that. I did see that. Yes. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, that dude really impressed me because he's he's a follower of Crowley and Shiner. He loves them both. He's like really scholarly, uh, and he made the insightful point that's really the, school. Yeah, yeah. The anthroposophical breakaway from the Theosophists, yeah. and yeah, he made the point that it's really the same cosmology except one is the right hand path and one is the left hand path. So Aleister Crowley is the Dionysus to Rudolf Shiner's Apollo. Yeah. Um, and, and you have sort of the same thing with the Aleister Crowley was a member of the Thule Society as well with Dietrich Eckhart, who was the grand master who uh, tutored and initiated Adolf Hitler. Um, so it seems like in both schools of the Shiner School and the, the Thule Society Nazis, occultists both utilize the black son of the occult, a sign for the, you know, the, the, the ritualistic, you know, uh, solar eclipses and the, the, the whole mm -hmm. thing. Um, but except one has a left hand sort of rotation, the other has a right hand rotation. One is white, one is black. One probably indicates the the darkness of night. The other the the lightness of the sun. The the, the white one is the the Rudolf Steiner symbolic version. Um, they even today ha have it in their biodynamic farming calendars. Is this black? You know the white sun of the occult, and invert like I said, that's the 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 Sol Invictus, the 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 solar deity or representation of the solar deities of Apollo of Mithra, all the same freaking thing of of uh, uh marduk marduk another solar deity uh all lucifer uh, precursors 
So then, you know, you, you got this whole thing, you know, and, yeah. and again, one is Dionysian, one is Apollonian, and you got variations for the masses and variations for the elect that get more fucked up as you go up. <laughs> right. The, the esoteric and then the exoteric explanations. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, the, the Hegelian dialectic, which is long precedes Hegel, but it does seem interesting. I, I wonder how much of it is the, you know, intentional dialectical poles or, how much of that is just that they're kind of working together because they have a, a shared agenda. I guess that's kind of the same thing, but like, I, I would wonder with the ne Neoplatonists and the uh, Aristotelians, like how much of that was kind of a. On the higher combined... levels, I think that they're all working together on the higher yeah. level. And right. then on the lower levels, the under, under initiated, they get their disputes. You know, it's, it's, they really do have hate, you know, yeah, the, the other groups they they really get in debates, but the oligarchy loves it because they 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 want to control the debates in in their own like everybody's wrong, so the, the oligarchy's happy, <laughs> right? Right, and it, it perpetuates all the chaos and all the the death, and it, that that's a breeding ground for the usurpation of power by them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I know you. We we should wrap up. I think you mm -hmm. need to go, and I've kept you for a very long time. But if you have anything you want to add, please do. This was incredibly edifying and fascinating so i learned a tremendous amount please tell everybody where they can find you also and uh yeah cool yeah thank you no this is i love chatting with you courtney and, and you're you're bringing up so much actual love and knowledge of the topics that i rarely encounter from from an interlocutor I, I i really appreciate having you as a collaborator on this stuff it's great and um yeah the 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 website as you're showing a huge forward. honor thank you <laughs> so that's the rising tide foundation uh website uh that my wife and i uh co-manage she's the president uh cynthia chung um so a lot of cultural stuff really good edifying material on there we do weekly meetings if people want to get involved they can send us an email at, at info at rising tide foundation.net and, and we do weekly seminars and reading groups and stuff so that's always fun and um the other uh website is my canadian yeah CanadianPatriot.org. Um, keep that's a little more politically punchy stuff, um, and that's that's updated pretty regularly too. They, people can make a donation on the right to our, our documentaries. We're making documentaries, um, and we're also doing some uh, some traveling as well to do different conferences. I, I noticed that you're also doing something uh, to intervene on the European Union insanity. That that's wild. That's cool. Yeah. What are you, what are you doing? That uh, so that would be the end of May. I do need to raise funds for it because it's really expensive. Uh, okay, and I, say, uh, anybody who had the impulse to like give me funds because of this interview, give it to Courtney instead. <laughs> no. Um, and and then when she comes back with her with her uh, victory march, then we'll then give give you can start donating to me if you're listening to this right now. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's a Geneva project. Uh, or if you're if you have the means, give to both, please. Um, oh, exactly. Yeah. That's a win-win. Yeah. But what you did, what you did in the in the state legislature, like I said, in what was it, Tennessee or something? It was. It was no. in Tennessee. Yeah, yep. that was fantastic. If you do even half what you did there, I mean, my God, it'll be just a wonderful, wonderful gadfly approach to just disrupting the apple cart. It was really, really enjoyable. Um, <laughs> powerful. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, so that's it. I mean, and there, there's books, there's like science books I've written in my, you know, that that's all available on CanadianPatriot.org and the uh, Substack. on, you know, will feature the Tesla series that we're doing right now. Uh, Which we, is so I, I'm good. And we're going to have a discussion about that on Dangerous Dame. So I'm looking oh, forward shit. to that. <laughs> oh, damn. Yeah, that's gonna be cool. Okay, yeah, let's do that. On, you're right. We're doing that on Monday. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's gonna be exciting. Yeah, great. So if you haven't read it, but for the audience, uh, I highly recommend it. It's it's fascinating, and it might totally shift your entire paradigm. So, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> might piss you off, too, or it might shift your paradigm or a bit of both. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, but, yeah, definitely uh, in, in, in my recent research, and that's the new science book, yeah, uh, that just came out. Um, Tesla is, is coming out playing a surprisingly important but – really dark role much darker than i imagined in this whole yeah. grand story so yeah that, that's coming out in, in installments every few days um yeah it's gonna peak with awesome. elon musk well and i think it ties right into what we discussed because i think the transhumanists really that that whole movement really comes out of the theosophical movement yeah uh, and a lot of the same philosophical underpinnings so yeah. uh, and the same people who want to enslave us and because they think we are already trapped and they don't see the soul as being immortal uh so they they want to 
solidify everything here now and they want to trap us but they think they are going to become the gods that will live on forever and be uh immortal but here on earth not an immortal soul so yeah so we'll revisit but thank you so much and uh thank you all for watching and listening <laughs>